Champlain test. TRC testing, TRC testing.
Good morning. Could I ask committee members to please take their seats? We have quorum in the room. So welcome to uh, the uh, Transportation Committee meeting. Um, it's, it's obviously budget meeting because Dale Harley's in the room and wants to talk to us about infrastructure. So we, we look forward to that, Dale. Um, new slides? Excellent. Um, uh, uh, no regrets received. Uh, any declarations of interest? Thank you. Um, can we confirm the minutes of February the 4th, 2015, please? Okay, communications is listed. And um, number one is on the, we'll go through the, uh, the consent uh, agenda. Uh, there is uh, number one on the list is improving vehicle safety in the city's commercial vehicle operations registration rating. Uh, do we receive this report or are there any questions for staff? Okay, we'll hold that one. And then the draft operating budget, I believe we have six delegations to speak to that or seven delegations to speak to that matter, so we'll hold that as well. So we will go back to the uh, number one on the list. And um, uh, Councillor Fleury, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My question, uh, so I understand the report, I understand what we're trying to do and how we're trying to comply uh, with that ratio. Uh, I just don't know where it's, why we weren't alerted as committee uh, last term because this seems to be two years in the making. We're trying to, where we get a failing grade on, uh, on those standards. And I, I wonder if there's a, we don't know much about, in the report it speaks that we're not meeting those benchmarks, but uh, it really doesn't identify if there's a specific group in the corporation that's, uh, that's causing that for us. Uh, through the chair, we were working on the plan after meeting with the MTO, and uh, because we required FTEs to complete the plan, that's why it's at the budget uh, this year. So I missed the last part. We required FTEs to complete the plan, so that's what's part of this year's budget, and that's why it's in front of you uh, today with, in conjunction with the budget. And uh, the specifics of, is there a, a spot in the corporation where they were causing us to fail, it's too early to save them, or do we know where, what's happening? Uh, through the chair, no, it's just an, uh, an all-around rating for the entire fleet. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions on this report? Received? Thank you. Um, so we'll move to number two, which is the, uh, the draft operating capital budget uh, tax and rate uh, support it. Um, I'm going to ask staff to come up and uh, do a presentation. Uh, then if you could hold your questions uh, for staff until after the public delegations. And then I'm going to ask uh, the vice chair to, uh, at that point, to introduce the roadmap motion so that we can go through the budget, uh, various uh, portions, and vote on it uh, as set out in the motion. So, Marion, I'm going to turn it over to you to... Uh, lead us through the presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, uh, I think everyone knows who's up here, with probably the exception of the gentleman to my right. This is uh, Sarah Rogers, who is the, um, is the financial brain trust in uh, public works. So the uh, budget before you today, uh, Transportation Committee, uh, again, I'll do a presentation. You'll then go to your public delegations, questions to staff. Uh, we will then, if, I don't believe there's any motions to amend at this one, but we will review the operating and capital budgets, uh, go through and uh, recommend those with amendments to council as seen fit. So the areas you're looking at today, primarily it's public works. So uh, almost everything in Mr. Wiley's shop with the exception of forestry, which goes to environmental services. And then in the planning and growth management area, you have the transportation planning area that you're reviewing their operating budget as well. Uh, Wayne is up here because the most significant thing that this committee does is actually the capital part of the budget. 
So the budgets you're looking at in public works, uh, you have uh, the general manager's office, his business services area, traffic services, road services, parking, and then fleet. Um, collectively, and sorry, and then you have in planning and growth management, you have the transportation planning area. Uh, collectively, these areas have uh, expenditures totaling 168 to 169 million dollars, and they have revenues offsetting that of 18 million, most of which, which you'll see is in the parking area, uh, leaving a net requirement of 150 million dollars in taxation, which is 4.7 million higher than last year, and represents a 3.3% increase overall. Parking services as per your parking management strategy uh, that was adopted several years ago sees all of the revenues that are required um, to, uh, that are generated from parking go to either pay for the, the service itself or our contribution to your parking reserve. So none of that revenue uh, flows into general revenue to be used for other city services. In terms of your FTEs, the only FTE increase you have here is for the six uh, commercial vehicle operators registration officers that was in the previous report that you just approved. So an increase of six in fleet services uh, for 2015. So the highlights of what's causing the $4.7 million increase overall for these areas. Uh, Primarily, they're in the maintain uh, category. This is 3.4. The 4.7 is just for maintain uh, for your contract settlements, potential contract settlements, your increases in inflation on energy, uh, fleet, cost of goods and services. Um, this is one area where when you look at the fuel budget, there is actually no saving on this line. The price has been reduced, but the increase in the amount of usage, the kilometers driven, so the volume increase has been offset uh, uh, or the price increase has been offset by the volume increase. So there's a small increase overall in fuel. Uh, you did actually realize probably around $250,000 in savings from the price adjustment in this area. But as I said, you're, you're driving more kilometers, so you're using more fuel, so it, it was uh, a net pressure. And then there is new parking revenue from some surface lots uh, on Queen Street and Albert Street. In terms of uh, the requirements for legislated, that's 1.2 million. So you, you have your CVOR requirements and licensing increase. There is new money for uh, rail crossing and utility uh, placement uh, regulations that have come into force. And then there's a small amount of money that we've started uh, with respect to coming up with a roads invasive plant strategy. This deals with the issue of, of wild parsnip and a few other invasive plants that are, are becoming a problem. In terms of growth, you have uh, an increase. Your, you have your annualization of the new crossing guards you put in place in 2014, and then there is money for uh, expanding the program in September of 2015. Um, I think most of you have seen this slide. This is, uh, we put it in every presentation and it talks about the fact that once the budget is done, you're actually not finished deciding what's going to be done and you're going to start with your term of council priority setting session, which is May, June, and it sees you uh, divvying up the, what we've got as an operating envelope uh, available to you over those, each of those four years and then a, ca a capital envelope uh, over those four years. So that process will start in, um, in May. Many of the things that you would be looking for, and, and primarily I know there's been some discussion about where's the money for the cycling pedestrian facilities. That was all funded in the last term from your strategic initiative. So again, it's being funded or it's being referred to that particular process for consideration. The capital budget, um, this is really the, the crux of, of uh, the, what you do here, $217 million, that's one-third of the overall spending in uh, capital in 2015. Uh, 132 of it is for renewal and $89 million of it is for growth. How are we funding that uh, 217 million? It's a variety of sources. Uh, mostly, though, it's cash. You've got uh, 54 million coming from the reserves as cash towards those projects, and 70 million coming from development charges, cash towards those projects. 
uh, gas tax revenue, our gas tax of 22 million, and then uh, a small amount of revenue from provincial or federal governments of, of 330,000. And then you have uh, approximately uh, 30 million or 30 percent of it being funded from debt, rate debt, which is in accordance with your model that uh, we adopted two years ago, and your tax and DC debt, uh, which is approximately $42 million worth of, of, of debt. So at this point, I'm just um, um, with respect to the capital, this just gives you a breakdown of where the capital is being spent, because it is spent on a number of different initiatives. You have your integrated program, which is a combination of basically bad roads with bad pipes underneath. So you're doing it all at once. And so it's coming from a number of sources, uh, rate and, and tax. You have infrastructure services that has standalone projects that are not, uh, don't include uh, changing pipes or re renewing pipes. Uh, planning growth, mostly what they have is growth projects. Uh, and then public works has both a combination of renewing projects and growth projects. So in total, 127 of the 217 is for transportation uh, uh, roads. Transit services, there's 40 million and it's growth, and then fleet services has 1.9 million. At this point, I'm just going to turn it over to Wayne, and he can talk to you briefly about his the ISD capital projects. Thank you, Marion. Just on a, from an overview perspective on the renewal front, uh, as Marion alluded to, on the, un, under the uh, integrated road pro program, I guess the first time I've heard it is bad roads and bad pipes. But essentially, it's a third, uh, almost a $48 million program, and you can see the breakdown of almost $9 million versus uh, about $39 million for the 39 represents the, uh, the underground work related to the sewer and water mains. And then the remainder of the projects range from uh, guide rail replacements and upgrades in the rural area, the annual road resurfacing program, which is citywide uh, structures, uh, non-transit uh, structures, and the sidewalk and curb rehabilitation program. Just a few more specifics on the next slide. Uh, the annual road renewal program in the order of a little over $22 million. Highlight a couple of projects on so Satan Drive and Swale Road. Last year we saw it was about a $52 million program that a couple of projects were not able to proceed because of uh, insufficient funding, so those became uh, top priority for the 2015 year. And on the integrated front, again, almost a $48 million program. Uh, some of these projects are related to the original Ottawa and the move, and there are some top-ups as part of this budget, ranging from Maine and Queen Street, um, and, and an integrated project uh, in uh, the Banning, Banning Abbotsford, Belvoir, and Single area, um, and again, a couple other projects under the, o, under the ORAP program and McCray Avenue. So that just gives you a, a range of projects uh, throughout the city under the integrated umbrella. And then under the transportation services, we have the Minto uh, Bridges Phase 2. There's a total of three bridges. Uh, the, those are the bridges located uh, near the old city hall. Um, phase 1 is completed. These are heritage bridges, and these allow us to uh, do the re rehabilitation of the remaining two bridges. Uh, McElroyth Bridge, um, it's a, a renewal of the existing bridge, and that's the bridge that's located at the end of Main Street crossing the river, and the timing of that project will be coordinated with Main Street from an overall traffic management perspective. And another project we're doing on Shea Road to highlight, um, it's related to a municipal drain, but the, the city is responsible for uh, the works within the right-of-way, so that's, that's a culvert rehabilitation. Thank you. For uh, the Public Works Capital Program, um, on the renewal side, we have street lighting uh, major replacements, and that's our pole replacement program and our cable fault program. Life cycle renewal for traffic control, uh, basically rebuilding our signals and our cabinets where they've, uh, uh, they're at end of life. And then life cycle renewal for fleet, that's just re to replace uh, the vehicles that are coming end of life. On the growth side, uh, new traffic control devices, that's for our new signal programs that are warranted, uh, including roundabouts. A safety improvement program, uh, that's a program where we put in uh, safety measures uh, like anti-skid uh, resistant pavement in high collision areas. Uh, and then we have two, uh, two facility projects on the books, uh, on Terry's Yard, which is basically a, a, a area where we do currently have a snow disposal facility. We're looking at putting a yard there to serve the south urban core, Finley Creek and Riverside South. 
And then the Bloomfield Yard expansion uh, is the yard at Bloomfield off Scott Street, uh, where uh, we've, uh, we've got to re-rationalize the space just to uh, fit uh, our core parks and core forestry crews. Mr. Chair, in terms of uh, planning growth management, we have a new, most of our work is done in, in the growth, as uh, the city treasurer said. In terms of our, our renewal, the, uh, the, the largest one we have for that is the area of traffic management. That's where we you know, look at neighborhood issues in terms of uh, you know, looking at the impacts of uh, traffic on the neighborhoods, and uh, there is a, a program that's, that's laid out in the, in the budget for that. In terms of growth, the growth relates back to the transportation master plan in terms of the uh, the projects that were approved through the, in the main approved through the uh, transportation master plan. Uh, so you see in there the, the list of roads that uh, we're looking to, to renew. It also speaks to, in this budget, we have the, the dollars to do the EAs that, uh, again, were, were laid out as priorities in the uh, transportation master plan. And uh, near the bottom of the, the last slide speaks to the uh, number of modifications. Again, that's uh, monies that we set aside to improve intersections, and the, the bulk of this year's budget is committed to improving a number of intersections along the Prince of Wales. And as the city treasurer said, in terms of the, the cycling program, the majority of the cycling and the, uh, that program is in the uh, strategic initiatives. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for your uh, for your presentation. Uh, again, I'm going to ask uh, my colleagues to hold their questions for you until we've gone through the public delegations. And I'd like to ask Dale Harley from the National Capital Heavy Construction Association to come forward. And following that, we'll hear from Eric McCabe from the Gotta Go campaign. Uh, good morning, Mr. Harley. Mr. Chair, good to go? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. As you know, my name is Dale Harley. I'm here on behalf of the National Capital Heavy Construction Association. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide uh, input into the uh, 2005 uh, uh, tax-supported budget. Um, in an attempt to uh, make this year's presentation a bit more interesting in response to your question, Keith, uh, we've adopted the theme of A Tale of Two Cities. And as you may all recall from your high school days studying one of Charles Dickens' most famous novels, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. Um, into the 2012 uh, Canadian Infrastructure Report Card that was prepared by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities gave municipalities an opportunity to benchmark themselves against other municipalities across the country. The report was broken down into four sections that examined drinking water, wastewater, stormwater, and municipal roads. And what we did is an analysis of the 2015 draft budget against the backdrop of this infrastructure report card uh, to uh, reveal what we consider is a very interesting story. On the one hand, we have environmental services infrastructure. And as you can see from the slide, the condition of drinking water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure in the city of Ottawa is in pretty good condition, albeit not quite as good as other cities across Canada. I think it's safe to say that the root cause of this happy tale um, of improving infrastructure can, can be traced back to the city adopting a realistic 
uh, increase for rate-supported infrastructure and uh, investing the vast majority of its infrastructure dollars on renewal of these valuable assets. And this year, to the tune of $214 million, or 79 percent of the environmental, uh, Environment Committee uh, capital budget. On the other hand, we have transportation infrastructure. And while almost 50 percent of roads across Canada are deemed to be good or very good condition, the story in Ottawa is really quite different. In the city of Ottawa, just 20 percent of all the roads are deemed to be in good or very good condition. And the story gets even scarier when you look at the collector roads, where over 50 percent are rated as being poor or very poor condition. As your own Comprehensive Asset Management Program report notes, deferring maintenance of infrastructure assets has a cost that can represent, present itself in the form of increased future renewal costs or reduced services. Now, despite this need for infrastructure renewal, investment for roads, just 53 percent of the Transportation Committee budget in 2015 is spent on renewal. The good news is, is that this percentage uh, is increasing in future years. The bad news is, is that the Transportation Committee capital budget continues to decline uh, this year, uh, next year, and we see it marginally increasing in 2017. The story gets progressively desire, or, uh, dire, I should say, uh, when analysis of last year's multi-year forecast reveals it was more promising than this year's uh, forecasted expenditures. So in conclusion, the story of infrastructure renewal for the City of Ottawa is truly a tale of two cities. On one hand, we see the fruits of the uh, meaningful infrastructure investment that you've made in water and sewer, ser sewer services, uh, and we applaud you for that. On the other hand, we see the city falling behind uh, in its investment on road infrastructure and how that is leading to deteriorating roads. The next chapter of this study or of this story uh, could be a tragedy if the city of Ottawa, if in, in the city of Ottawa, if this council does not take concrete steps today to turn the situation around. And if the council could commit to a small change in road investment this year, it would be easier to bring a more positive change in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Harley, for your novel approach to, uh, to the presentation this year. Um, are there any, uh, any questions for Mr. Harley? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Eric McCabe from the Gotta Go campaign is up next to be followed by Ken Holmes. Sent it. I don't know what you guys did with it. Well, good morning. No sir. wasting time. It seems to have misplaced the uh, the file I sent. Uh, if you could. Um, I'd be happy to have your presentation distributed amongst the committee members. Um, once once we've we've found it, well, it's pretty short. Oh, you're up you're up there, I think. No, not not that's not it. I sent it. I, I didn't I didn't send a PowerPoint presentation this time. It's a very simple. Word document. Maybe it's from the last time I was here at the Environmental Committee meeting. I don't want to subject you to the same information. It's it's actually it's time. actually a PDF, so I think it may be your presentation. We could open it up and we could just double check. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, you're good to go. You have five minutes, sir. I'll use less than two. That's okay. So, 
Well, good morning and thank you for this opportunity to present to the committee. I'm Eric McCabe and I'm a member of a group of volunteers requesting the City of Ottawa to provide public toilets at the major transit system hubs in Ottawa. We request that the Transportation Committee include the provision of accessible public toilets at major transit hubs in the development plans for the Western Transitway and other rapid transit systems, as well as in the improvements in support of Council's strategic priority for transportation and mobility. Doing so would be consistent with the mission and vision of the Committee and I am quoting from your documents, to set the direction and manage the evolution of the city to enhance our quality of life, where we can live, prosper, connect in neighborhoods, building spaces that are vibrant, well-designed, safely built, and sustainable. And with the specific responsibility of this committee to provide a range of modal choices, including walking and cycling in all areas of the city, and to encourage residents to choose alternatives to driving. And we believe the provision of toilets, particularly the downtown core and major transit hubs, will do so. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. McCabe. Um, are there any questions for the delegation? Uh, Vice Chair. Thank you for that. Um, the, uh, sorry, can you hear me? Um, do you, you are currently uh, working the Gotta Go campaign on um, doing outreach in my ward, I believe, around Dundonald Park. Is that right? Or? That's one of the areas we're doing outreach in, yes. Okay. And are there other areas that you're looking at at the this Well, we've been handing out flyers at uh, transit stations and, uh, and uh, places like Eagleson and Trim. Okay, but my understanding is that the Gotta Go campaign has got a small amount of money and are doing outreach around. Oh yes, uh, public yeah, very much. That, that's our target right now. Okay, and our that's primary. and that's at Dundonald Park. Dundonald Park specifically, yes. Okay, okay. Um, well, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I think that um, you know. Um, perhaps I, I would like to, to work with staff um, to look at uh, uh, a broader direction on, um, on the uh, uh, public washrooms uh, across the city, especially in parks. I do very much support the idea of one in Don Donald Park, Absolutely, and I know that yes. my, uh, yeah. my community does. So um, just I'd like to take it offline to, uh, to work with staff to look at the issue and uh, you know, try to see if we can't get a reasonable and, uh, and of course, an affordable um, action plan. So um, I will commit to doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Any other questions uh, for the delegation? Thank you very much. Um, uh, Ken Holmes to be followed by Jason Garlow from Hidden Harvest, Ottawa. Morning, Mr. Holmes. Five minutes, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Ken Holmes. I'm a resident of uh, Ward 5, West Carlton. My presentation this morning will uh, focus on the condition of the railroads in uh, Ward 5, but I think the deficiency in road maintenance is citywide. The many West Carlton residents report concern over the deteriorating conditions, and a recent poll uh, rates that at about 75%. Uh, are showing very negative thoughts about the condition of our roads. The report card on our roads uh, is not good and it's getting worse. On average, the condition of our roads in the rural areas appears to be deteriorating by about 5% per year. 
and there's no indication that our current practices uh, can slow this deterioration. Budget 2015 uh, does not seem to indicate that the deteriorating condition is being addressed. The supporting data that I'm using throughout the presentation is extracted from city sources online. The primary source is the 2012 uh, State of the Assets report. And in that report, many of the city roads are defined as having a condition of fair. And the de definition of fair means that it requires attention. If requires attention was the predominant comment uh, on your child's report card, I think you would do something and do it now. I suspect that many of our roads are getting close to the tipping point and something needs to be done to improve the regular repair or an expensive rebuild will be required. This is your child's report card. Anything green is basically good. That's the light green and the, and the dark green up at the top. The variations of yellow and gold means that attention is required. And in summary, only about 15%, that's 15% of the paved local roads category are in good or better condition, while only about one-third of our gravel roads are given a passing grade. This is not a new problem. For example, we were advised that in the three-year period, shortly after amalgamation, there was an observed deterioration rate averaging about 5% per year. By 2012, only 15% of the local paved roads were rated as good or better. And in 2013, using the new assessment criteria, Citywide, less than half of the city's roads were rated good or better. Are you happy with this report card? The information on this slide is from the latest OMBI report. It's interesting that this data is not being reported uh, on the city's own performance management system. The year 2013, uses the new Ottawa methodology that is stated as being a better representation of the conditions. So only 48% are rated by the city as being good or better. The year 2011, 2012 saw another 5% drop in the performance of our roads. The latest OMBI report is showing that less than half of our paved roads are in good condition or better. Now, in addition to the quantitative assessments made by the city as illustrated above, we recently conducted an online poll. More than 75% of the 130 people that responded have assessed the rural roads as needing improvement. Comments are grouped under these categories, most of them being non-complementary. The rate of deterioration will only increase if not adequately addressed starting now. If we don't address these problems now, we'll be in an expensive rebuild situation as opposed to routine maintenance. Roads are getting worse by about 5% per year based on the city's own stats. Currently, less than one-third of the roads in the rural yeah, area Mr. Holmes, you've, you've exceeded your five minutes. We're going to have to ask you to, to wrap up, rated is good. So clearly, budget 2015 needs to better address our increasing backlog of road maintenance projects. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, are there any questions for the delegation? I, yes. 
Thank you for your presentation. Um, just wondering if you would suggest any funding sources for to address that. If what, what are you suggesting a tax increase to deal with it or something else? Probably like most areas within the city, the problem is not necessarily where is the money coming from or what additional money is available, but what are the priorities? And certainly in the rural area, roads are a high priority. Sorry? Uh, Councilor Moffat, you'll, if you have a question, you have an option. I'm sure Councilor Moffat's just helping me. Staff. He's just pointing out you didn't really answer the question. Uh, where would, what, okay, you said roads are a priority for you. I understand that. But um, if, you, if you don't think it should come from the tax base, then where should it come from? What, what would you do without to deal with the road issue? Well, if you, you want the, the Coles Notes answer to what I would do, I would start off with a consultation process in the development of the budget that starts off better at the front end and ask for consultation input at that stage as to what the priorities are. Unfortunately, the residents are now faced with essentially a fait accompli, an 834-page document, and were asked to comment on it. That's most inappropriate when you're asking residents to comment on what they like and what they don't like. I think it's much more effective if you start off with appropriate public consultation at the early stages so there is a good understanding around the council, amongst the staff, as to where residents feel the priorities are and where trade-offs would be appropriate. But it's not appropriate at this stage to ask me where would I come up with the money because all that we end up with and there's a fight between what are my priorities and what are your priorities. The important thing is to get agreement on the priorities at the front end when we're producing a real draft budget. I have a couple of quick questions. You mentioned the importance of public consultation, which leads me to the poll. You said that, that we commissioned the poll. Um, who's we? Can you tell us a little bit more? Because the poll's not in your presentation, so who set it up and what questions were asked, that sort of thing. Okay. The, uh, one of the groups that I work with uh, is the W5 Citizens Council. Uh, it's a group formed uh, basically after the, uh, the last election, a group of citizens who were interested in making things better uh, in the ward uh, and agreed to form a, uh, a committee uh, that we intend to carry on the work. Uh, basically over the, the next four year period and uh, look at areas that are of a concern to uh, Ward 5 and uh, analyze them, study them, make recommendations back through the various committees. And, and again, to the, to the poll, is this, this is a poll that this city... This was a, a poll conducted on the website. Uh, it's been uh, conducted in the open for about a month and a half. Uh, we have, as of this, this morning, 130 uh, respondents. Uh, and uh, the results are that approximately 80% uh, are saying that they're not happy with the condition of the roads and we should be able to do better. And, and just, just, just one last question. So this is a poll that your group put together. You didn't, you didn't send it out to a polling company or anything else. Just no. Basically put a question on your website no, like, and, like, ask, and ask people to weigh in on that question. No, like many of the, uh, the citizens group, we're not very well funded. Uh, we're just starting up. Uh, we're, we're working basically on a, on a shoestring budget. Uh, but at least we are uh, conducting open polls. Uh, and uh, we will, over the years, be getting more professional studies done, uh, but it's a start, and uh, it's certainly as valid as uh, many of the other polls that I see being uh, conducted and, and used as a basis for comments. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. We're now going to hear from Jason Garlow, who will be followed by uh, Randy Kemp. Uh, Jason is with Hidden Harvest, Hidden Harvest uh, Ottawa. And I believe a PowerPoint to you, Jason. Uh, you have four slides. Uh, okay, you have five minutes. 
Great, I'll start my timer too to keep on track. Uh, hi, Jason Garlow with uh, Hidden Harvest Ottawa. Uh, we're a group of about, uh, thanks, uh, we're a group of about 700 volunteers, 3,000 supporters that go around harvesting fruit and nuts. Uh, we're here to support what City Council is already doing, which is great, and this might be weird that I'm here with transportation, uh, but we're here to support the work that Public Works has been doing to address uh, changing community needs uh, through policy, staffing, and community outreach, specifically within the, the budget uh, the, the business services branch here of Public Works. Uh, I'm going to start with our, acts, our ask, then I'll go on to say good things. Uh, so our ask is for uh, $45,000 um, uh, to be diverted from the annual budget each year uh, to fund the expansion of Hidden Harvest's community harvest programming. Um, doing so during this term of council uh, would allow us uh, to grow so that in, th in four years from now, we'll be harvesting 5% of the city-owned fruit and nut trees that are currently already growing in city parks and in front of people's houses on, on the roadway allowance, the medians, things of that nature. Um, harvesting 5% of the city-owned trees means that we'll have enough uh, fresh fruit and nuts to feed approximately 50,000 people in the city. And that 50,000 people is about how many people are currently accessing uh, city uh, uh, food banks and meal programs uh, throughout Ottawa. Uh, so what we're finding on the ground is, is the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Uh, this is a, a city park. There's about there's 200 pounds of apples underneath this crab apple tree or crab apples. We know that because we rake them up and we put them in uh, yard waste, waste bins. And it was a real easy process. The city came and picked them up with a big truck, and the truck was staffed with two people, and they took it to a centralized processing facility that was way out on the outskirts of town. Uh, so back to my notes. Uh, so, uh, but w w th then what we did afterwards was different. Uh, what we did after that is we picked uh, another 150 pounds of apples. Uh, we took those apples not to a centralized processing facility, but to our distributed network of small batch processors. So in this case, we walked these four blocks down the street to Top Shelf Preserves, and she made crab apple jelly with one quarter of the apples we harvested. Half of the uh, crab apples we harvested here were taken to uh, Parkdale Food Center, and they did processing and made crab apple jelly to support their programs. And then the final quarter of crab apples were taken home by the volunteers that helped us pick. Uh, so uh, when what, what, the reason I'm here, we're talking about litter, and, and the city knows knows how to handle litter. So like when we raked up those crab apples, it was taken care of. I didn't even have to phone anybody, anybody to get the, all that waste picked up. Uh, the city knows how to deal with it. Uh, but but it, the apple is only considered litter when it falls from the tree and begins to rot. If it's fresh on the tree and is considered food, there, there's really not much around. Uh, when we look at what the city does, the great stuff that the city has been doing to address uh, litter, there's a huge policy framework. There's a lot of municipal spending. When you look at the staff, uh, city workers to clean up, we hire the bu bucket brigade every single summer, a team of students going out to do great work cleaning up uh, litter. Uh, and we also have a lot of community action. So if you at the neighborhood level in your ward want to take community action to address litter in your neighborhood, there's the cleaning up the capital campaign, there's adopt a park, there's road, adopt a way, roadway, as some as the, the number of community programming around litter. Um, so how did we get to this? Well, it's because uh, public uh, perceptions, or uh, sorry, uh, the, the reason how we got here uh, was public values around litter started to shift around the 50s and the 60s. So uh, back then, people didn't want to be living in a dirty city. Uh, their perceptions changed, and, and the city took action by developing bylaws and fining people for littering and, and building this whole, what we have today, of, of a suite of, of, of litter activities. Um, Today, in the 21st century, public perception is starting to shift in the same way around food and food waste. And that's something that our group is seeing very clear on the ground. Uh, public's perception uh, is starting to shift, uh, uh, and the values are starting to shift, uh, so that if they see healthy, nutritious food, um, they feel it should be feeding people rather than being turned into compost just because we have to meet a certain level of, uh, uh, of compost going to the order world facility. 
Um, so that's changing. So we think that it's clear that, that getting litter off our streets and into landfill has huge benefits to our city. Uh, and similarly, strategic investment in addressing food waste, like rescuing fruit and nuts before they become litter and enter the waste stream, can have an even greater impact to the city's health, uh, cleanliness, and community. So I have a few seconds left, and I'll show you. If you meet us on the street, this is what it looked like. It's a group of five or six people harvesting a city tree or city shrub. In this case, it's an elderberry bush. Uh, we picked 120 pounds off of two elderberry bushes in a city park. This is the before picture. Uh, and this is some of the processing we did. So another one of our processors is Michael's Dolce. We take a quarter of the harvest there. He makes this wonderful elderberry syrup and generates some revenue to come back to our program. Uh, so I guess that's my spiel and that's my time. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going to start off uh, the, the questions. Um, interesting, interesting idea, and the metrics are interesting as well. The the amount of money invested and the amount of people that you have indicated could be could be fed, or uh, with that number. What I'm not certain of, and I'm going to direct the question to to our treasurer. Uh, as to whether this is the appropriate budget to be talking about this or this is more properly with, with, with the CPS budget. Because technically, I think, we don't classify fruits and nuts as litter, especially when they're still on the trees. So I'm just, I'm just wondering if you're in the right venue. I think it's fascinating. I, I hear that question a lot. We presented to the Environment Committee and was told, well, you know, you're talking about litter. That should come over here. Uh, so we're used to getting batted around. But yeah. So I'm, I'm sure the Treasurer can figure it out. Yeah. Help. My, um, no pressure. <laughs> my advice, Mr. Chair, is actually it is Community and Protective Services because that's uh, where we deal with community funding for initiatives uh, such as this. Now, Hidden Harvest is a social enterprise. We're not a not-for-profit group or a charitable organization. Uh, so we are looking so, sort of a contracting thing. Uh, we do have to pay taxes uh, when we begin to generate a small profit. Yeah. So just, just to be clear, now that we have a road map, if you will, um, so the ask is $45,000 mm -hmm. per year, and that will harvest 5% of the, it, the fruit it will allow us. It will allow us to grow so that in four years' time, by the end of this term of council, we'll be harvesting for our... Our, our program will have grown t so that we've had enough people trained and enough equipment purchased to harvest 5% of, of the city's fruit, own fruit and nut trees. Yeah. Well, the bonus is that you have the chair of CPS sitting on this committee as well. So. Okay. Oh, hello. So, <laughs> so I'm not sure what she'll do with it, but the message has been received. Absolutely. Message received, but we've already considered the CPS budget, but between now and council, I will speak with the departmental officials about the possibility. I don't know if there's a funding source, but I'll check it out. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think everybody's kind of intrigued by what you're proposing here. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah. Councillor Medic. Yeah, I just, <clears throat> since we got him here, I figured, I think I'm on both other committees that he's already talked to, um, but uh, your group, how is it funded right now? Uh, right now, we're funded uh, through basically sponsorship. So community uh, sponsorship, uh, Bridgehead, Bose Brewery, uh, uh, companies such as that, uh, Ernst & Young, uh, fund half of our budget. The other half comes from the sales of, of jams and jellies and uh, uh, workshops. A lot of it comes from workshops that we hold, like pruning workshops, community engagement workshops. Uh, and also speaking, so we do a lot of speaking events and things like that and outreach in the community, and we receive funding from that. So, so that's how our, our budget uh, happened in 2014. Prior to that, we had some grant funding from the Ontario Centers of Excellence and, Ontario, and the, uh, uh, a few other small programs for a bit of funding to develop the business case and business plan just to grow as a social uh, purpose business or a social enterprise here in the city. Yeah. Do you know any other programs maybe that are already functioning? Uh, so matter? we go through the city of Ottawa uh, to get permits to harvest the city-owned trees and we're not aware of anyone else uh, doing that at the moment. Uh, there are, like I said in my presentation, showed in my presentation, the Ottawa Food Bank does have a program that deals with food waste specifically at the restaurant level and at the grocery store level. But again, at the city level, uh, there's not policies or anything in place to say that you have to use that program. It's sort of a voluntary basis if, right. if the business owners want to. So you said if you can get to 5%, that could feed roughly 
50,000 people, like how much that, per that's year? That's right. Like so how much food are we talking per person? That, that, what you're talking to per, per person is, is, uh, is similar when the food bank says they feed someone, they give them a three-day supply uh, a three-day supply of food. So each each of those 50,000 people will get about a, a three-day supply of fresh fruits or fresh nuts. Yeah. I think that's outstanding. Um, I think what you're uh, identifying here is a, we have a bit of a, uh, a gap here that we, we're pretty good at feeding the landfill. <laughs> uh, right and I think you want to feed people with the food. So Exactly. Um, the I same amount this. of effort except instead of processing into compost, yeah. we're processing into food. No, I think yeah. it's a great idea. I, I support it. So good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you for your support. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Chernyshenko. Thank you, Jason, uh, for presenting. And yes, this, uh, I've, as you know, I've followed the, the work that your group's been doing for a number of years mm -hmm. and uh, um, encouraged, but perhaps wasn't able to find a particular source of funding um, until now. Um, it, it does sort of fall through, uh, can, if we let it, fall through the cracks. I hope we won't let it because it's one of those things where it touches on environment, it touches on transportation. Um, if, if, in fact, this produce is being treated as litter, mm -hmm. then it is you know, both a transportation committee cleaning up our roadways and an environment committee, uh, mm -hmm. what are we doing with that waste uh, in the end? Are we treating it as waste? So I'm curious, have you attempted to calculate what sort of tonnage we're talking about and, and uh, yeah, any it, conversations of what it's currently costing? I know it's difficult to ask you this, but what it's costing the city currently to cart that away and deal with it as waste? Right. So given the, the budget documents that are publicly available, it was very hard for our organization to get down to that level of granularity because we're talking of such a small amount. In 2012, an uh, investigation looked on to what the city was spending on that whole litter framework, and it was estimated to be $5 million. So that includes things like the, the, the diesel for the trucks to get it to Orga World and the processing and the recycling and stuff. So the suite of litter project litter funding is approximately $5 million in 2012. Uh, what we see on the ground uh, at Hidden Harvest going to community parks and programs, and we also participate in the Cleaning Up the Capital uh, campaign, many of our volunteers do, what they see is approximately 5 to 10 percent uh, of what's going out of those programs is food waste. Um, so if you would take the 5 to 10 percent of that litter budget, I'm sure it's not 5 or 10, but I'm sure it's closer to maybe five, 4 or 5, 6 of that five million dollars going towards the the policy the the policy the programming and the staffing uh, around uh, this litter problem that we have here in the city um, you, you'd be looking at yeah it would be about five percent so so one percent would be what one percent would be about the fifty thousand or the forty five thousand we're looking for um, and I'm sure you could easily find if we sat down with uh, the accountants uh, that maybe had numbers at a more granular level uh, could easily tease out uh, two hundred to $300,000 that the city could be saving. Yeah, mm. yeah I, I'd certainly like to commit to work with Chair of uh, Community Protective Services, with city staff to identify just what is the cost saving here because we, as, as I believe you're, you're contending um, yes. this may actually be revenue neutral for the city. We yeah. might in fact be shifting costs that we're currently paying to do one thing um, towards a more productive use and it would be helpful when we come um, to the budget discussion uh, uh, at full uh, committee of the whole um, for us to, to know that whether it is in fact a budget pressure or just moving money uh, from one mm -hmm. area to another. And, and that's exactly right and a lot of it also depends on what you do with the food. We give 50 percent to the food banks and food agencies but if we kept all of it with the, the premium that you can get for locally produced food, um, you, you could be generating a lot of uh, revenue. Uh, but I mean, you know, this is about feeding people, not making people rich. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Kakish. Thank you, uh, Chair. I just had a couple of questions. Uh, uh, the first is where uh, the 45,000 would mostly be allocated towards for with your organization 
Right. Sorry, I thought I was about to get out of here. Uh, the uh, the forty five thousand. What we're looking at uh, is is no different than the, uh, what we've currently been spending uh, fifty, sixty thousand dollars on a year. Uh, f about uh, five thousand goes towards outreach activities and commute farmers markets, things of that nature. Uh, ten per ten uh, ten thousand goes towards administration. That's like liability insurance. We have a lot of that. We also pay rent at Hub Ottawa. It's a shared office space downtown uh, where we work. Uh, another 10 goes towards uh, training the neighborhood leaders. So it's a train the trainer model. So we're not, uh, we're not going out in the field and picking all this. The community is doing it. So neighborhoods that want to get interested, we train the trainer. We pr also provide them with equipment. Uh, so that would be another 10,000. So we have the five for five thousand for outreach, ten thousand for administration, ten thousand for for training and equipment, and then twenty thousand would be salaries. That's approximate, I mean, uh, but that's based on the averages of previous years. Thanks. Yeah. And you know, I think this is a great initiative. I don't think it's at the top of the priority list for for us, but that's I think right. where there is an opportunity to perhaps collaborate with youth under the mandate of this committee is with perhaps our resources in forestry. Uh, in our public works department if we can pilot something and see how that works out and then and go from there I don't think we're necessarily interested in in financing the the operations and the administrative aspects of your mm -hmm. organization but if there's an opportunity uh, to collaborate and partner up through the forestry department on a small pilot project and see where that goes I think that's something I'm prepared to uh, support thank you Mr. Great. Chair thank you Thank you much. Uh, Councillor uh, Deans. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to uh, thank you for giving us a little latitude to address this issue here because since CPS has passed, I think this is our opportunity really to ask the delegation questions. So thank you for that. Um, um, Mr. Golo, when you spoke, you described Hidden Harvest as a social enterprise, which mm -hmm. as I understand it is some rain. I, I don't know if that's a term that we use in the municipal act, but I think it's uh, basically for profit that rolls the profits back into the community. Is that basically? Yeah, it? that's that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So to Ms. Simulac, then I think the question is under the rules that municipal act or whatever that we um, are governed by, can we fund a social enterprise um, if? If council decide, I, I, I mean, I'm picking up around the room. There's a lot of interest in this, but would that be possible for us to fund that? Um, and I'm apologize. I didn't when you just told us before that you were for profit. I didn't pick up on that. But yeah. in fact, under the municipal act, you cannot give a grant to a for profit. That, uh, so that's right. this would end up being a purchase of service. Mm -hmm. So the I would suggest the route is that. Uh, Mr. Wiley would have to receive a, a, um, uh, a proposal from you as to what you would do and he would have to do the evaluation as to whether in fact it does reduce, uh, create capacity within his budget to be able to fund it, but it, it cannot be done as a grant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think um, maybe I could suggest to you that you work with some of the departmental officials offline to talk about a process. I don't know if it's possible to get that done between now and budget day on March 11th, but um, I just suggest to you that while you're here, you speak to them at this table and maybe uh, you can at least work out a process. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Treasurer, just, just so I understand, so we're back to Mr. Wiley now? So, Yes, we are back to Mr. Wiley. Okay, so we're out of, we're out of CPS and we're back at this committee now. Okay, so Kevin, maybe you can raise your hand. So. He knows who you are, and, and uh, I, I think what you're hearing here, Jason, is there, there is an interest in what you're trying to do here, and there seems to be some legislative hurdles, if you will, to, to getting there. Um, but I think uh, if staff would take that as a direction to, to meet with uh, Jason between now and the budget and see if there is, is some room to move there, uh, I think everybody around this table, both transportation and CPS uh, would, would appreciate that effort. Okay, thank, thank, thank you, you so much. much. I, I agree. It'd be a lot easier if we were just a bunch of garbage men. Uh, <laughs> thank you. So um, we're now going to hear from uh, Randy Kemp from the Wellington West BIA, who to be uh, be followed by Mr. Chris Bradshaw.
Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for uh, allowing me to be here today to speak to, you, uh, to uh, or speak to the transportation budget. Uh, my name is Randy Kemp. I'm a board a member of the uh, board of directors of the Wellington West BIA. Uh, have been since we were founded eight years ago, and I'm also, more importantly, today uh, the chair of the cycling committee. Um, what I'm here to talk to you about today is basically, oh, wrong way, is basically. Uh, uh, cycling on Wellington Street West. Now, uh, to give you a, a sense of where we are, for those members of the committee who do not know where Wellington West is, uh, our eastern boundary is the O train, our western boundary is Island Park Drive, and uh, we make up the, uh, the uh, two communities of Hintonburg and Wellington Village uh, from Scott Street uh, to almost the Queensway. Um, our mandate is to enhance and promote uh, Wellington Street uh, uh, West as a uh, business area. Part of that was uh, to find out where our customers are coming from, and uh, so we initiated a modal study back in 2012, uh, and we were actually uh, very surprised by the results. And uh, this was a sampling of 800 people who were actually shopping on Wellington Street, and over 60, or almost 60 percent rather, of the people that we surveyed either traveled to our area by walking or cycling. We were kind of floored by those those uh, those metrics, and so we did it again in 2013, and uh, not quite as strong results for the cycling walking, but still in excess of 50% of the people use active transportation to come to Wellington Street. So two times uh, gives you a sense, uh, three times is a trend. Again, we are well over 50% uh, of the people using active transportation. Uh, you only need to stand on Wellington Street at any of the corners and observe uh, the amount of people that do travel through our neighborhood on a bicycle. Now, why this is, this, uh, this particular slide gives you a sense of what's going on in our neighborhood. The red circle is a one kilometer radius circle, uh, and it pretty much encompasses all of our BIA. Tunney's Pasture, a major employer in the north. Uh, then we have the Civic Hospital in the south, uh, both uh, significant employment centers. Um, but we're also under tremendous pressure for uh, de uh, development, both infill development in our neighborhoods, but also condo development. And the green stars on this map are condo developments that have been built in the last five years. But more importantly, the blue stars are de condo developments that have been pro proposed or, and or approved. The two red stars are office uh, uh, projects. One is uh, 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 building on Holland Cross. The other is the Innovation Center down on Bayview. We've also uh, managed to secure uh, a, a business friendly designation through the Ontario by Bike People. We are the first BIA in all of Ontario to, uh, to uh, receive that designation. The reason we pursued this is because Wellington West is exactly in the center of the uh, absolutely uh, fabulous network of uh, cycling lanes that uh, are maintained and promoted by the National Capital Commission. The blue lines represent all of the cycling paths that are available uh, around uh, predominantly the Otter River and downtown. You can see that uh, there are tremendous opportunities for cycle tourism. Now there are two types of tourists. There are the people who come to Ottawa, but then there are the people that we call staycationers, people who live in the outskirts uh, of Ottawa who would like to come into Ottawa to cycle on these bicycle paths. We see that as an opportunity for cycling. And we also have the big event in 2017 when we celebrate our uh, 150 years. The next slide just demonstrates the support that we have for cycling. Uh, you can see that uh, uh, our membership, this was done last fall, wants us to promote cycling and wants us to move forward. The Ottawa Cycling Plan has in, uh, done a number of projects in our area. Uh, Churchill Avenue, the first complete street, uh, the O train, uh, the Hampton Park, all of these things have been approved and completed. We have a number of projects that are underway, uh, including uh, Byron Avenue, Gladstone. The problem here and why I'm here is there is absolutely no mention of cycling, uh, cycling infrastructure on Wellington Street West. And this needs to be corrected because this is where the cyclists are. And what I'm proposing is that we uh, uh, identify uh, 
some opportunities to improve the safety and the, the mobility of cyclists uh, on uh, Wellington Street. Uh, a, number of, a number of these items are being implemented in the Glebe uh, 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 cycling uh, uh, plan uh, that is uh, part of the Lansdowne uh, Park redevelopment. Uh, these are not new ideas and uh, certainly worth pursuing. So what I'm asking the committee for today is this, that in 2015, that staff resources put, uh, uh, be designated to work on a cycling plan for specifically Wellington Street West. It'll, it'll uh, connect all of, or bring together all of the work that is being done on other initiatives as part of the Ottawa cycling plan. Um, and the intent so would be Mr. to Kemp, implement it in 2016. to wrap up. I've gone a bit over time. And I'm all done. Thank you. It's off. It's on. There we are. <laughs> You're just telling. Yeah. Questions for Mr. Kemp? Uh, I'm just curious. Uh, thank you. It's certainly by far the, in a way not the first time we've spoken and I've taken a great interest in, in what a BIA is doing and recognizing that um, uh, rather than the old thing which is um, our clients come by car, therefore we need to do everything to make sure it's easy for them and they've got parking. What was fascinating about what your BIA has done is identify that in fact the, the majority of your clients, those who are coming to spend money in the area, are coming by other means. Of course, the car is still a significant one uh, and absolutely mustn't be discounted. But um, what I'm... Uh, what I am wondering is whether you've, you've continued to see support uh, in your, um, from your membership. You've given us some, some surveys uh, there. Um, around parking, um, that's a big challenge that we see is cycling infrastructure often has to take space that's currently being used for parking and that continues to be a, a, a clash. The merchant's view that that parking spot in front of my store is critical to me, and a bike lane would be great, but not one that's going to take away that parking spot. Have you seen any evolution there, or can you describe sort of the state of debate within your own members? Uh, uh, Councillor, through the chair, um, the parking debate has been ongoing for as long as I have been involved uh, uh, in the neighborhood, which is on, in excess of 25 years. I can remember doing a parking study back in 1992, and there was a shortage of parking, and it continues to be a discussion. Um, I think the, what we need to do as a community, as a, as a, certainly as a BIA, but also with the city, uh, what we need to do is reframe the discussion. And what uh, the, the Share the Road people have discovered through their surveys is that 85% of the people who cycle also drive a car and they also walk. So when we talk about pedestrians, when we talk about cyclists, and when we talk about people who are in their cars, we're talking about the same person. And so um, I'm not advocating for bike lanes on Wellington Street West. There simply isn't a business case to do that. We, 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 we cannot remove 50% of the parking off the street and not expect a significant impact on, on the livelihoods of our business people. What I'm suggesting, though, is that we grow cycling that we, we take all of these wonderful initiatives that we are currently working on and uh, tie them into the network, which is where people want to go, which is Wellington Street West. And, and what's, what's glaring in the Ottawa Cycling Plan is what's missing, and that is, is how do we address Wellington Street? We often, you know, I have, for those of you who are, are listening to the, the, the cycling uh, lobby on, on the Twistphere, it's always about bike lanes. And as long as we continue that us against them discussion, we're not going to get anywhere. So what I'm proposing in my two-year proposal here is one year of, of, of study and design and then implementation in 2016 is more of a community discussion around how we accommodate cycling on a traditional main street. And there, there are many councillors sitting on this committee who have exactly the same problem. And, and the, we have the benefit of the Glebe Cycling Plan uh, nearing completion to actually take some of the things that they're implementing and see if they do and can be f fit onto the main streets. Mm. That, that, I think, is probably near-term progress that is, is, is doable and is in the realm of possibility. Uh, if, we, if this debate comes about cycling versus parking, uh, it's, it's, we're not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you. For those who aren't familiar with the, the Glebe cycling plan work that we're doing, it does not involve a lot of creation of lanes. It doesn't. Uh, it, 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 it recognizes that Bank Street uh, is not going to have a bike lane on it. In fact, most of Bank Street doesn't even have sharrows as you do, but is rather um, trying to find ways to get people to Bank Street through neighborhood residential streets to set up missing, identify missing links, opportunities to make safer, provide parking, and that's essentially what you're asking for as well, to take that same sort of approach. Rather than picture, you know, we have to have a bike lane on Wellington Street, instead all of the little pieces that will get people there um, and the street itself will feel calmer so that the cyclists can be in with the traffic on that street. The, 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 what I tell people who ask about cycling on Wellington is that what will make Wellington safer for cyclists is more cyclists. And if we can do things that, that take, us, take us from the, the 5 or 10% modal share, which is predominantly people who, who are very comfortable on a bicycle, and move it into the 10 to 20% modal share, which incorporates the people who are who, who want to cycle but are leery of being mixed in with traffic and there are things that we can do to to alleviate those fears. One is connectivity. We have we have tremendous opportunities like Glebe on our side streets to to accommodate people but ultimately they have to get to Wellington if we're going to actually have commerce go on between cyclists and businesses. So this is what I'm after and it's, this is not a big ticket item. Uh, we are a fraction of what the Glebe uh, cycling uh, plan, uh, what, what, what I am proposing is a fraction of what the uh, Glebe cycling plan is actually accomplishing. We are, it's only two kilometers of road and there are only limited opportunities, but there are opportunities and I would like us to do them sooner rather than later, especially with the pressure of the buses f f uh, being put onto Scott Street and it really is a total unknown what is going to happen in our community in terms of traffic because of the build out of the LRT. We just don't know what's going to happen. And, and this would be, in, in, in some ways, preparation for uh, mitigating uh, uh, measures to, to help us with that, that displacement of, of buses out of the transit, uh, transit way. Okay, thank you. I think this is something we'll all have to pursue through some questions to, to staff after we're done with delegations and also um, in the strategic initiatives, really. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot of us who want some of that money for all great initiatives, and we're going to have to be uh, seeing how that's most strategically allocated. But thank you for this very helpful presentation. Thank you. Councillor Weeper. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. I'm just wondering, uh, any time we see uh, suggestions for, for example, sharrows, you know, the debate um, uh, lights up in the social media. A lot of cycling advocates feel that sharrows are potentially even more dangerous than, uh, than bike lanes. We know the pressure on Wellington for hard bicycle infrastructure as well. It's a lot of divided opinions on what can be done to make Wellington West safer. To what degree are you coming to the table having already tried to achieve some kind of an idea from the broader community, not just the business community, of what we can do to make Wellington West safer? So looping in the residents looping in the uh, Citizens for Safe uh, Cycling and, and groups who are stakeholders in all of this. And as we pursue this, you know, to what extent can uh, we count on the BIA to demonstrate some leadership in helping us to pull these various folks together and seek some consensus items that we can bring to city staff for action? Well, uh, in terms of leadership, I'm here today, and uh, we do have a cycling committee, and we often uh, sponsor any sort of a cycling uh, event in our neighborhood, just just to, to continue to have that uh, that uh, promotion of cycling. Um, in terms of, of uh, working with the community, I think the fact that we're at the table and talking to the community is a, is a giant step forward. Uh, and uh, this is an opportunity uh, for us in the sense of creating more commerce for our businesses and demonstrating the, the, the power of cycling in terms of, of, of generating uh, uh, business, just the economics of it. Uh, but more importantly, I think we can have that debate about cycle lanes on Wellington. We can talk about the business case of it and, and perhaps just put it to rest. Now that said, I fully expect that my grandchildren or great-grandchildren will cycle down a bike lane on Wellington, Somerset, and Richmond Road. It's just a question of building the modal share. And that's where we have to do the work, is building the modal share. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Fleury. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to um, to thank you for being here today. It's rare that we hear from BIAs on cycling issues, um, and, or we hear about them, but not publicly. And I think that it's important that uh, that you make the case. And but there are a couple of uh, elements, the uh, path of resolution, if you will. Uh, for us, we're always told by our staff that. Paint is not an expensive thing to do. So, you know, you can work closely with the local council and staff to, to get some, some pilot aspects or, you know, road painting fairly quickly. If you have a broader plan, I mean, it's unfortunate because that road was redone recently, but there might be other opportunity through the cycling plan and others to invest. So uh, really working closely with the local council and staff on, on some of those aspects can, can get you far. And, and for us at committee, I mean, last Last term, we've really committed to some of the pilot projects along Laurier and others, and perhaps uh, as we review our term of council priority, uh, the uh, sp the um, the strategic initiatives, uh, you know, in discussions with your local rep, that you, you might be able to uh, to put put uh, priority on, on on that plan. And I realize it's there's two aspects to it. It's a two-year. Uh, Proposal, but uh, you know, you, you could be impressed with what you do with current resources. Just a different way of uh, of approaching it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're now going to hear from Chris Bradshaw, to be followed by Trevor Hashay. He was here. Morning, Chris. You know the rules. You have five minutes. Thanks very much. Oh, sorry, I hadn't put it on, but thank you for saving me back there. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit larger scale. Um, I am uh, somewhat obsessed, as most people know me, about the car and our environment. I was co-founder of Virtue Car. I uh, co-founded uh, the uh, Auto Walk and the Gotta Walk Group, which is part of public health. And I'm a member of the <coughs> uh, Parking Stakeholders Consultation Group, which is under Kevin Wiley in the operations <coughs> department. And it was quite nice to follow a group of uh, representing a BIA that wasn't asking for more parking uh, here. And I commend a gentleman for it. And I gave him my card to suggest a possible solution for the street. In any case, I am suggesting today what you too should be obsessed with. After all, you as counselors on this committee dealing with the budget must also be thunking, thinking, how can we get out of the annual rut <coughs> of simply patching together a few of the status quo demands the st voters have and start thinking more boldly about the future. Councilor Chernichenko, who I see is missing right at the moment, uh, mused in the media yesterday that his bold initiative was to deal with climate change here at the municipal level. The car is at, our, at the center of our, your committee's mandate. You need to spend time thinking about the car and how you will get a breakthrough in the next four years. And I, of course, picking this particular budget because it's the beginning of the term for all the new council, all councillors plus uh, those of you that are new here. <clears throat> I suggest that there's no better place to start understanding this phenomenon than to look at what is called peak car. This refers to the death of the ever-growing VMT, vehicle miles traveled or, or driven, that has occurred annually since, well, the first day cars were manufactured in, in mass and the people were persuaded to replace the shared trams in cities uh, with private cars. Oh yes, they were considered clean in those days, but then guess what they were being compared with? The, uh, the horse and its uh, challenges to uh, good health in our city. The car's natural place, however, was the countryside, not the city. The city if it didn't replace the horse and buggy. Uh, they didn't replace the horse and buggy, but the tram. It was the great connector, and, <clears throat> and it became the great connector for the next century. The tram ironically ran on electric power from Shorty Falls, which now helps to power our water supply. 
something I learned when I worked at the old planning department at the region when I stored documents in the old pump house that was just saved from the wrecking ball by a few months at that time we realized that maybe water power was better than paying for a brand new pumping station that would use electricity uh, or uh, sources from other particular sites. <clears throat> now a century later, in 2002 to be exact, we now know, this uh, peak car occurred when they started seeing a drown downward trend in vehicles miles traveled and uh, also did further study and find out that it was young people who were not getting driver's licenses very early and were not buying cars, but were in fact infatuated with the technology. The great connector to them is the internet. It is woven into their lives by computers, smartphones, and programs and apps galore. Technologies that now, that seem to have a 100% market share, far greater than the car was ever able to achieve, and thus no one is in fact really excluded. There's not an internet equity issue as there is with transportation equity. The car is not just necessity, uh, unnecessary, but it gets in the way of being connected. A bike or a bus pass plus a couple bucks for a few taxi rides or virtue car uses a month, and you can get by with just walking and cycling. And uh, this is, of course, walking is our species' most complete and useful exercise. You never need a club membership or, to, or a car to drive to and from your club or a McMansion big enough to have a dedicated exercise room. <clears throat> Finally, it is, it is, I find they, these people find it so easy now to see what our generation did not, that the car is the author of so many of our urban and global problems that its days are numbered. Hopefully that number is very small. Madison Avenue, however, would have us believe that all we need to do is have cleaner and more efficient engines, and that will do the trip. Sorry, that won't touch at least eight problems. I'll read them off quickly. Road congestion. How can roads be congested when the cars on them are 80% empty? Road or sprawl which younger adults shoe despite the lack of any reflection in property taxes or user fees of the costs of sprawl. Road stress, death and injuries caused by the car, and the worry that one would experience such mayhem or would in fact cause it to others. Transportation equity, which I just mentioned. Fitness and health, we have a whole department here, the health department who's dedicated to issues related to health that often are the authored by our uh, dependents on the automobile. <coughs> Then there's a decline in social engagement and, and, and social capital, civic engagement, which is the lifeblood of a municipal government. Governments manage that which we share. If we can't get people to not only share what they have and to realize, the, and realize that they're not uh, an island in themselves, only to go to the polls to get what they will mean something for them, but better for the community, we won't have gotten anywhere as a government. And the final thing is local economic vitality. We don't hear as much about it since the big bust in 2000 when we were, after which we were no longer considered Silicon Valley North. We now have to... Chris, I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up. Okay, You're about 30 to seconds over. The writings of Richard Florida, William White, and Jane Jacobs who talk about urban economics in a greater sense. I would just finally say that a couple of things I would recommend is to set up a trans-seed institution to sponsor more integration of our existing modes and to set up a pilot of a car-sharing, ride-sharing uh, hybrid that I have talked about. And also, um, I uh, propose to the parking stakeholder group an idea of a park and ride at Herdman for transient users, for tourists, and seniors getting to the hospitals where the high cost of parking is a very serious problem for their access to health care. Thank you very much. I appreciate the times. Thank you, Chris. Uh, are there any questions for the delegation? I'm going to ask Trevor Hashe to come up next, no. followed by John Woodhouse. Morning, Trevor. You have uh, five minutes. Good morning. Councillor Aglai and uh, members of the committee. Um, I'm speaking today uh, as I work at the Healthy Transportation Coalition. And just for your background, uh, this is a new group of uh, organizations, individuals, and businesses that are working to improve the city for pedestrians, cyclists, and public transit users. We now have 20 organizational members of the coalition and about 50 individual members. In late October 2014, I believe the letter is being passed out to you now, um, we wrote to the newly elected uh, City Council and the Mayor with our asks related to Budget 2015. We were kind of early, um, but uh, we wanted to get our asks in as early as possible. The letter referred both to the budget and the term of council priorities. 
We asked the city to uh, consider doing five things. One was to spend $3.5 million on the pedestrian facilities program in 2015. Number two was to create a protected bicycle lane network throughout the city. Number three was to spend $20 million a year on cycling, matching the overall transportation budget to the percent of people currently riding their bikes, something that uh, Citizens for Safe Cycling has been um, in touch with you about as well. Number four is to implement a low income public transit pass which would be accessible to all residents whose income is less than the low income cutoff. Um, as for an update on that item, at a minimum we would ask that you please do not increase the cost of the community pass. Number five would be to commit to studying uh, a user pay approach for roads as part of your term of council priority strategic initiative commitments. <coughs> So that letter was signed and endorsed by the Centertown Community Health Centre, by Ottawa ACORN, by Citizens for Safe Cycling, by the City for All Women Initiative, by the Healthy Active Living and Obesity Research Unit at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, by Walk Ottawa, the Peace and Environment Resource Centre, the Graduate Students Association at the University of Ottawa, as well as three, as well as three University of Ottawa professors. At the same time and, and today as, as we speak, the city operates and is responsible for maintaining and repairing 6,000 kilometers of roads across the nation's capital. Many of those roads aren't good places for pedestrians and cyclists. And beyond that, it's not clear how the city's planning to pay for the required maintenance and repairs to those 6,000 kilometers of roads. You've really created a monster that constantly needs to be fed. And a previous speaker spoke about the deteriorating nature of many of those roads. One solution, of course, which would save money, would be to stop building new roads and stop widening existing ones, but rather follow the city's own policies that are related to encouraging people to walk and cycle and take public transit more, and instead invest those dollars in those other modes of transportation. Yet this budget proposes building new roads and widening existing ones. The budget supports funding a road through the core natural area in the green belt known as the Stony Swamp. I'm talking of the road project that would significantly widen Old Richmond Road and West Hunt Club Road from Hope Side Road to Highway 416. Of course, when you build more roads, you invite more traffic. The increased traffic negatively impacts air quality, creating global warming, causing carbon pollution, and creating a built environment that uh, is essentially creating barriers to physical activity. So it's all well, to, well and good to talk about increasing modal share, but if you're not providing safe places for people to bike, they're just going to choose not to bike because they value their lives. So as indicated in the recent item published by the Project for Public Spaces, beyond traffic and safety issues, many of our generation's most pressing challenges are bound in some way to our relationship with streets and the built environment. Reduced physical activity is a leading culprit of our current epidemics of obesity and chronic disease. Lack of access to good places has led to widespread social isolation and depression, particularly amongst older populations. Increased vehicle emissions have degraded air quality and contributed to the greenhouse gas, gases causing climate change and the lack of transportation options for many communities and residents of Ottawa has caused uneven access to jobs, social services, healthy food options and community interaction. So in summary, Ottawa needs to do much better to improve the city for pedestrians, cyclists and public transit users and it needs to make these improvements much more quickly than this current budget before you today would allow. I'd like to end with two questions, and they are number one, how many of the five asks in our October 2014 letter are included in the draft 2015 budget before you today? And number two, is money included, and this is perhaps of particular interest to Mary Ann Wilkinson, though I see she's getting up, um, is money included in the draft 2015 budget to ensure that sidewalks are built to and from the bridge that spans the 417 where Eagleson and March roads meet beside the Eagleson Park and Ride? If we want to get people on the bus, surely we need to create safe sidewalks to I and from ask you to wrap up, Trevor, you're Eagleson Park minutes. and Ride. So that's my uh, two questions. Um, how many of the five asks, asks in our October letter are included in the draft budget and is money included to build sidewalks to and from the bridge leading to and right beside the Eagleson Park and Ride? 
Uh, thank you. Are there any questions for the delegation? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Hashay. And I'd like to ask Mr. Woodhouse to come to the mic, please. And he will be followed by Mr. Glenn Gunanan. Morning, John. Good morning. You have five minutes. Okay. And I think you're here on behalf of Walk Ottawa this morning. Is that correct, John? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Am uh, I close enough? Yes, I am. Uh, my name is John Woodhouse. I'm chair of Walk Ottawa. Uh, Walk Ottawa as a citizen, maybe I can read better without my glasses, as a citizen volunteer group who uh, commits time, effort, and knowledge to promote walkability. Uh, we support the, uh, the proposal for the snow level, uh, snow level for, uh, cycling and pedestrian facilities that is being brought, brought forward as a, uh, as a council initiative. Uh, we do, we do need the, the, the improvement in the snow clearing. Uh, and, and I hope that this initiative will meet favorably, uh, with, with not only this committee, but also with council. And I hope that this is just the first step towards making our sidewalks more more, more walkable. Uh, uh, now, we know the, uh, we know the different constrictions about the budget because my counselor, Councilor Shirley, put a nice little column in our local paper outline the operational funding, capital funding, priorities, term of council that we're, uh, that we're talking, uh, I'm talking to right now. And uh, it's, uh, he goes on and says, uh, it appears a lot of money has been invested. The vast, the vast majority of the 30 billion plus Budget is already committed to maintain and improve the city's existing ser ser services. So I do know that there's very little money to go around, but walkability is, is, is extremely important for many different people. <laughs> And uh, as has been noted uh, earlier, uh, winter especially uh, keeps people in, 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 indoors, and uh, and uh, for the for the uh, elderly and for and for other other groups, this is this is very very. Uh, disturbing. Uh, what, we're, what we're asking is that uh, when you do look at, uh, at uh, snow removal, uh, uh, you look at the best practices in other North, North, North American cities. You don't have to reinvent the wheel here. All you have to do is look towards technology to update and to and to cut the cost of the uh, of the operations. Uh, uh, to get to get to get a good reading of uh, of the uh, uh, the walkability of 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 an area is to do walk artists. 
uh, with walk lights, you actually go around and you identify different areas that need to be looked at a bit closer and other areas that have been looked at and have been rectified and uh, uh, basically it's a good snapshot to to show where 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 things need improvement and where things are are working just 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 fine. Uh, and uh, as a final final piece of in, uh, I, as my final bit of information here is that when the uh, Highway Traffic Act uh, changes do I'm sorry I'm going to have to ask you to wrap up you're about 30 seconds over okay uh, do come into a fact I wish that you support them especially speed limits okay thank you thank you very much uh, John are there, are there any questions for the delegation uh, Vice Chair. Okay. Hi, John. Thank you for that. Um, I actually sit on Walk Ottawa with John, so I uh, have worked with him a wee bit over the last few months. Um, <clears throat> I do agree in terms of the, uh, you know, um, our pedestrians and the walkability of, uh, of, our, of our city, of our entire city. Um, but, you know, in particular in the downtown core, I think it's close to 80% of people who both live and work uh, in the in the downtown core, walk uh, to work. Uh, that's a that's a very high number. It, they you know pedestrians are our cheapest commuters, and uh, we we tend to spend the, the least on them. And uh, I agree with you. Um, I think that you know one area where we can make a tremendous difference is in increasing our uh, winter maintenance for cycling and, and pedestrian use. Um, it uh, you know it frees up the roadways for people who do need to drive. I happen to be one of those uh, multimodal folks. I you know I own a vehicle, um, but I I walk and, and cycle uh, as well. So you know just little things like having the multi-use pathway that was uh, built along the O line, uh, the O train line, um, maintained this winter makes a tremendous difference in the amount of people who will use it. Um, so. I, uh, I commend you. I thank you for, for coming today. I think that we need to continue to talk about um, about pedestrians and uh, and how we go around. Uh, we're, we're investing $2.1 billion in the light rail system. Um, we need to make sure that we're ready for it when it comes online, that when people step off of that train, uh, they have safe and comfortable pedestrian um, facilities, sidewalks, tree canopies, whatever it is a uh, well-maintained uh, um, uh, pedestrian and cycling infrastructure. So I, I thank you. And if I could just ask you one question, John, um, if we had um, if we had a small amount of money to invest, in your opinion, where where would it be? Um, where would be the best opportunity to do that? Well, surprise, well, surprisingly enough. It's uh, uh, this winter, the underpass has not been cleared. So that's, so that's unavailable for every pedestrian and every cyclist. So that, means, so that means that I have to cross the street for the National uh, Capital Commission or uh, look out over the, uh, over the canal to the to to the shadow Laurier down that street to Rido, cross Rido again and down Rido to get to the bus. So that means that I had to cross twice two nice big fast streets. And, and I tell you the um, the uh, the uh, the island, the pedestrian island, I can barely fit on it. 
I don't know how two or three other people can. But yeah, it, it, it's just little things like that. And uh, on my way here, I had to take the road because the curbs, the curbs were not, were not plowed because, because, be, because the road, the road plows come along, clear the roads, and it's blocking in all of the sidewalks. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for the delegation? Thank you very much, John. Okay, thank you. Uh, and our final, uh, our final speaker uh, of the day is uh, Glenn Gunanan. And again, if anybody uh, still wishes to speak to the budget, um, if they could go to the desk underneath the screen by the, by the exit door and, and sign in. Otherwise, this will be our last speaker of the day. Uh, good, uh, good morning, sir, and you have five minutes. You can, right, you can, you can sit down, it's okay. <coughs> can I start? You can sit. No, it's okay. I've been sitting. I want to stand up for a bit. Thank you very much. Okay. Hopefully my five minutes hadn't started it yet. My name, anyways, my name is Glenn Allen Kunana, and I'm originally from Toronto. I just moved to the city of Ottawa about a month and a half ago. And what's really my concern in here is, uh, sorry, I came late, but I seen on your agenda there's a pedestrian access section on it, which really concerned me, especially as a newcomer that, you know, been applying for jobs, interviews, and, I, you know, to survive, to start with, I don't have too much, so I have to use your public transportation, right? fit my budget, but the problem with that is, is the transfer, especially on the major intersection. Let's say if I'm going north, bus A, right, and I have to stop at the B going from west to east, right, now I have to get off here, but the next stop, actual bus stop is all the way right there, and now I'm right there standing, and your lights is the problem, because your lights gives more way to the cars more than the pedestrians. So now I'm trying to rush, I get splashed. Other than being splashed, I miss my bus and now I'm late for my interview. When I thought, when I go through your line and checked it, that was the actual estimation time and I was hoping that it was almost as good as like how I rely on TTC, right? So that's the problem. That's my main issue with this access on your pedestrian, the transfer, right? So instead of me just like going there trying to run, maybe, Maybe if you haven't fixed that light problem yet, because uh, the way I look at it, your, your, your traffic lights are most likely more favorable for the cars than the pedestrians. Unlike in Toronto, we have a cross even, even a cross section for that. To give customers, especially pedestrians, more time, more advantage in access, other than cars that could drive up to 200 k's, and meanwhile, our speed already on our foot is so limited. And they're the one who's more rushing, and we're the one who's always been fighting for time. And then now, the other access pedestrian problem is your bus stops. It looks like when you guys clear out the snow, right, you're only clear for the front door. But you're forgetting you have two types of different buses. The one that's just the regular buses, and the one that's a double buses. So now, when there's someone from the back, right, getting up, especially with a stroller, they're having a hard time with the snow banks on the side because you only clear the one at the front. Isn't that very inconvenient? Exactly. And the next thing is the washroom. The washroom problem. Well, you got 2.1 billion what on what? And you're telling me in TTC, even on our map, got accessibility legend to let you know there's an elevator there, there's a washroom there. So just in case, my stops is only it's still six stops away, but the next washroom, I gotta go. We all know that for a fact, that you cannot hold your room in, in, deep inside of you any longer. It's uncomfortable, and in the long run, it makes you unhealthier. And then what now? We gotta talk about healthcare budget after that, right? Exactly. So at least in that point, I could already tell, I could get off this station, do my business, get back to it, at least I'm not uncomfortable no more, on my way to my next mission. So that is the main thing. And the other one, you want to talk about bike lane? You guys messed up on your bike lane. You want to know why? You want to know why? Because the parking is still there. The parking site is still there. But if we could make, especially the main roads, 
make sure that no one's allowed to park there, I think it will be even better, even safer. Because even if you put, it doesn't matter, you could spray the best spray, spray paint on that, even a neon paint at night, night time. But if someone there is parked, that even, even, they, they don't even watch their blind spot when they open their door, boom! Your bike carrier is already gone. But they're just opening their door and you even get ignorance that don't even check their blind spot before they proceed and go. Exactly. So tell me now, is my five minutes still up? Well, I still got a minute. <laughs> so like, okay, so I'm gonna keep going with that. So like I said, if for now, like what we have in Toronto, I'll give an example of Victoria Park and Eglinton Avenue. That's a very, very major busy intersection in part of Toronto. But what we managed to do is, you know, we had the light set up better than your light set up, but what we also managed to do is, let's say, oh, Victoria Park, south of Eglinton. And then now, after that, after the intersection, we even have Victoria Park, north of Eglinton. So just in case there's some people from Eglinton wants to get up, that I have to rush and be like, oh yeah, it's just right there. It's just right there, especially if it's a senior who's trying to catch their appointment, huh? For their help, it's very convenient. So if, like I said, I'm giving you guys the advice of temporary patch until we fix those lights. There's more convenience for the pedestrians. Yes, up. If you could sum Do up. Do you have any questions? Well, I'm just going to ask if anybody has any questions for you. Because I'm willing to answer them. Councilor right Medical looks like you might have a question. <laughs> Any questions? I'm sorry, you might just need to vote for me in the federal level. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you could go to one of their committees, see how much time they give you. Um, Any questions from the delegations? Thank you very much for coming down today. Have a good one. Seeing as there's no more delegations, uh, I'm now going to ask Vice Chair McKinney to uh, introduce the roadmap motion so that we can consider the budget going forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I move that the uh, Transportation Committee recommend that Council, sitting as Committee of the Whole, approve the Transportation Committee 2015 draft operating and capital budget as follows. One, the Transportation Committee operating budget, page five as follows. General Manager's Office, operating resources requirements. Business Services, operating resource requirement. Traffic Services, as follows. User fees and operating resource requirements. Road Services, as follows. User fees operating resource requirement, parking services as follows, user fees, parking operations, operating resource requirement, fleet services as follows, user fees, operating resource requirement, transportation planning, operating resource requirement, the transportation committee capital program as follows, fleet services, Individual projects listed, pages 53 to 55. Integrated roads, water and wastewater capital program. Individual projects listed, pages 57 to 71. Tax supported funding. Transit services, page 72. Individual projects listed, page 73 to 75. And transportation services, individual projects listed, pages 77 to 127. Thank you very much. Uh, now that we've introduced the roadmap motion, I'm going to open the uh, open the floor to questions to staff uh, on on the budget. Um, so maybe I don't know if staff wants to come back up because I already have a list of people who want to ask you questions. So um, I'm going to start off, um, not so much with a question, but more of more of a, what I hope is a friendly direction. Uh, and 
going forward, what I'd like to hear back from staff or from or what I'd like to have staff consider going forward into the next budget session, which will be in the fall of this year, uh, so it's going to be upon us uh, fairly soon, is I'd like the staff to, to look at or consider the option of creating a reserve fund for snow removal. Um, and I say this because over the last number of years, we've had issues around uh, our snow removal budget. You know, one of the things that we obviously cannot control is the weather and, and the, how cold it gets and how much the snow sticks to the road and how much snow we get. Um, every year we seem to find the money to fix it at the end of the day, which is great, um, but it tends to be a bit of a scramble as we try and figure it out. My thinking is if we can find the money at the end of the day to fix it, then maybe what we could do is find the money in advance, set it aside in a reserve fund like we used to do, and that would take away some of that anxiety towards the end of the budget snow year uh, to determine. So that's just something I'd like staff to consider going forward into the budget cycle for 2016. Is that, is that friendly direction to have a look at that concept? Um, Mr. Chair, you... Um <clears throat> Excuse me, you do have a reserve, so I don't think you mean create a reserve. I think you mean contribute to the reserve. Yes, yeah, sorry, yes. What I, mean, what I mean is a fixed a fixed amount to go into the reserve uh, um, every year. I, that is a good direction, and I think actually that's one of the issues that should be discovered when or discussed when you do your term of council priorities. Uh, because while we were able to offset most of uh, 2014's deficit in winter maintenance with other sources, those sources were one time. They weren't permanent. So uh, this is really a base budget issue that uh, needs further discussion. So thank you for that and uh, for agreeing to have a look at that. And we will raise it, or I will raise it again at, at, as we proceed. Um, so the first councillor I have on the list to ask uh, questions is uh, Councillor Deans. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. Um, my first question to all of the um, department heads is if you could just go through your section of the budget and tell us how much risk is built into that budget this year. Uh, Mr. Chair, the, um, from a renewal perspective, uh, the, the approach of identifying needs are, is, is a risk-based approach. Uh, so we look at all the assets uh, included here in front of you with the roads and guide rails and resurfacing structures and, of course, the buildings in, in relationship to that. So we don't currently have uh, – there are no risks of failure in our, in our, in our system, but these, uh, this money – and the identified priorities are based on a risk-based approach and uh, have been uh, identified and recommended accordingly. I'm not exactly sure that answered my question. I mean, I know we've been building more risk into the budget and the, some gapping. And I just want to understand the probability of additional problems based on the risk. Uh, Mr. Chair, are, are you referring perhaps to the uh, contingency funding allocation or, or risks of failure based on the funding level we have right now? Whatever risk you know about, we want to know about. That's what we want to know. We heard from one of the delegations that we're way behind in terms of road re repair and that those costs become bigger if they're not taken care of. How much risk is there? Okay. I understand you now better. Yeah, from a from risk perspective, the... the, the the comments made is, is correct. The funding levels are not, are not sustainable and adequate. And that's why in, in 2012, uh, the Comprehensive Asset Management Plan was brought forward in coordination with the Long Range Financial Plan. And through that, we identified the risks of not um, increasing the funding through that program. So if we adhere to that council direction in 2012, which is an example, it takes renewal funding from approximately $80 million up to the $165 million, uh, by 2022, that is our that is our risk mitigation measure that that's in place. If we were to uh, remain at the level as not increase as planned, then you would have risk the network. As an example, the uh, the road system. There's about 25 to 30 percent of the roads are in fact in some form of repair. If we do not fund at the right levels, that number will increase. That is recognized. Um, and when we take our funding. 
if it is limited, we would want to be focusing on directing our funding to the higher risk projects such as uh, bridges, major arterials and what have you. So the, the risks are if the funding levels do not, do not increase as planned, the infrastructure will continue to deteriorate. Anyone else want to answer that question? From a public uh, work standpoint, I think the big risk, as the Chair has pointed out, is our winter operations. And what we've seen over the last eight years is, well, since 08, when we had the very large year, we had three years where we were able to contribute to the reserve fund, and then now we've had three years where we've taken out of the reserve fund. And they've been pretty rough years for the operation. Um, I'm not in a position where I'll ever compromise public safety uh, to save costs. I, I don't have a choice there. Uh, but I think the risk for us now is uh, we'll be moving this summer into a process of uh, really taking a very detailed look at the operation to see where we can adjust our levels of service, if there's any capacity throughout the network, uh, but also potentially where we might have to increase those levels of service a little bit just to keep meeting uh, our budget targets because I think this, if the weather continues and the winters continue this way, um, it's not really sustainable to continue being over budget every year. Mr. Chair, from a transportation planning point of view, I I think the risks are, aren't there in terms of, you know, being able to, uh, to, uh, to afford it. We've certainly adhering to the affordability plan that was laid out in the transportation master plan in terms of us being able to deliver the, the projects that we've identified as, as growth. So, uh, you know, basically the timing is there from the, the transportation master plan. It's in the, the budget. Then turned over to uh, Mr. Newell's group to to construct. So, you know, I think uh, Mr. Newell's identified some you know more risks in terms of the existing infrastructure as opposed to the to the new. Okay. Is that it? Okay. Thank you uh, very much for your answer. I do want to talk about this long-range financial plan that we did and how we're doing because my impression is we're not doing terribly well, and we seem to be underfunding it. So, Ms. Simula, can you just remind us of the plan and the recommendations for year-over-year -year funding and how we're doing compared to what the plan was? Uh, we actually aren't doing too badly. You approved the plan in 2012, and at that time we recognized that for the tax-supported uh, capital assets that we own, we needed to be investing, <clears throat> excuse me, an additional $80 million a year in uh, renewing them um, beyond what you were currently doing. We have been, as per the plan, we have been increasing the contribution to capital by both inflation and $5.4 million every year since. So you've had 13, 14, and this is your third year of, so you've added another $15 million in already. But what that plan did recognize was that, um, so if you only do 5.4 million a year, it's going to take you 15 years or more to get there. So we were looking at that time to see if there would be a federal or a provincial program that would allow us to have um, funding coming in in a uh, systematic and predictable way that we could direct towards renewing our capital assets. There was, at that time in 2012, there was an ask out to both those levels of government for that funding. That funding has not come through, and what we had agreed in the long-range financial plan was that we would come back in 2012, or sorry, in 2015, uh, with a discussion at Council if, uh, because Mr. Newell and Mr. Gonti are going to be refreshing their, their asset management uh, uh, plan come back with that and talk about how are we doing with the gap and do you want to do more than what you've already committed to to accelerate the closure of that gap. Okay, so we're going to see that this year. Okay. That is the intention. Our first priority, though, was to do water and sewer uh, capital assets, but yes, we will be getting to the tax-supported capital assets. Um, I'm hoping in time for the 2016 budget, but given as that will probably start within a couple of months, uh, it may be the 2017 budget. 
Okay, well, I think the sooner the better, because I think uh, we need to have the time to address these issues in a sustainable way. Um, I want to talk about the transportation master plan that we passed last fall. And, you know, with great fanfare, we pointed out that we had a compatibility piece, which was the affordability uh, plan. And so everything in the plan, we're keeping it real because we could afford it. And now I'm concerned when I look in this budget document, what I see is a lot of, for example, the cycling and pedestrian is moved it's in strategic initiatives, and I heard what the Treasurer said in their presentation that it's been in strategic initiatives in the past, but I don't know. When I look in this budget document and I go and look through the works in progress, I see under growth, I see that there were numerous funding sources for cycling that were actually in growth. So now it suggests to me that there's more money, there's less money in growth, more of the cycling and, and pedestrian plan being put into strategic initiatives. And I don't know that that's part of the affordability plan. So can you just clarify that for me? Um, I'll clarify that for you as um, finance did the affordability plan. The assumption in the affordability plan was those strategic initiatives, that funding for cycling and pedestrian networks that had been approved in the last term of council, that that would become permanent. And so uh, when we came to this year's budget and it was, that wasn't SI, the decision was, do we make it, just throw it in the budget and make it permanent and reduce the envelope that you have available for capital strategic initiatives, or do we keep it in there and allow council to basically reconfirm their commitment towards it, at which time it would then become permanent for the four years and if direction was given, for subsequent years. But it was built in as an assumption in the transportation master plan. I understand the, the sort of the confusion that goes with this because you thought it was there and it was going to happen, but your funding for it was based on your strategic initiatives last year and uh, we made the decision, and I apologize if, if it uh, wasn't the right one, to allow council to again reconsider this as a part of the strategic initiative. So it is there and you'll be seeing it in a, in a, a few months time and uh, but if you want to advance it if you don't want to have it as part of the strategic initiatives process it's a simple enough process to write a uh, um, motion that would have you pre-approve that right now that's as simple as, as, as to take care of that counselor okay well for what it's worth, my opinion is cycling and pedestrian that was part of the affordability plan should be a growth project. It should be embodied in this budget. shouldn't be a strategic initiative. I think the Laurier bike lanes, because that was a council initiative, it was a pilot, it was something new, it was a strategic initiative. But funding cycling and pedestrian plans, that's a growth item and that should be in the budget. That's my opinion. I don't think it should be in SIs, which brings me to SIs because there's this body of money. I really feel we should be doing it all at the same time because, frankly, we don't know what we don't know. And we don't know how much of that is already allocated for things like cycling and pedestrian plans that we should reasonably have thought would be in the budget. And so now they've been shifted to SI, so as our term of council priorities, it appears that more and more of this money is getting eaten up, committed, and we don't know what we, what we uh, aren't funding. So I'm really concerned about that. I think it would have been a much, much better process to share with us the, the list of strategic initiatives and what uh, is funded for, through that source that we're obviously going to need and how much actual discretionary money is left because I suspect it's not a lot. So is it possible to provide us with where you are currently on strategic initiatives and what you are proposing? Um, I'll have to um, um, cycle back on that question, no pun intended, uh, with <laughs> respect uh, to that with the city manager's office as his office is running that process. Uh, I understand we've just been basically compiling a list of everything that we know you did last time and you'll wanna, you may want to continue, things you've approved subsequent 
uh, to that, initiatives that you want brought forward, like there's the air climate uh, change or whatever that's called, that, that environmental plan. Uh, those items, those are all to be brought forward. You directed us to bring those forward. Uh, winter cycling was another one. You directed that be brought forward as part of uh, the strategic initiatives discussion. So we have been compiling a list. I will check with the city manager as to uh, what he would like to do with respect to distribution of it. Um, I don't think it's all committed, Councillor. I think uh, uh, there is still some flexibility. And uh, as I've told other committees, the whole point of the exercise is for you to go through priority setting so that you can come out with a list at the end that the majority of councillors are support and think needs to be advanced. Thank you for that answer. Just uh, one um, word specific issue and then I will um, um, give the floor to the next questioner. Um, but it's um, the below the line projects for resurfacing projects. I have a number on page 102 in my ward that are falling below the line and I wonder what the status of those projects are. Um, they've been pushed back out of 2015. I wonder, um, I have constituents that are obviously eager to get on with these projects and I wonder what's going to happen to them. Do they get pushed to 2016 or is that like the uh, life cycle for Parks and Rec which is completely unrealistic and it's probably going to get pushed to 2021 or sometime? Uh, Mr. Chair, so the the annual allocation for the road resurfacing program, we anticipate it being increased next year, but when it's below the line, there's two opportunities. Um, if the projects that are above the line come in uh, tender prices to do the work on a favorable basis, then we can start to progress to the works below the line. If, if we're not able to do that, the projects below the line then become top priority for, for next year. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Is that that's it? Question was okay. Um, uh, Councillor McKinney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just want to pick up also on the um, uh, cycling and pedestrian um, uh, infrastructure funding. So I, you know, I do agree that uh, you know when we when we had when we when we had the transportation master plan um, uh, brought to us, brought to the community, I. I think that if you went out and asked anybody out in the street out there um, what they thought of the transportation master plan uh, in terms of the funding, they would say, well, you agreed to fund $70 million in cycling infrastructure over 15 years. Um, it's certainly what, what I believe to be the case. And what I'm seeing now, so if I look at um, page 133, you know, in 2015 and 2016 combined, we're looking at spending, you know, maybe $4.8 million and then nothing in 17 or 18. So that doesn't add up anywhere near 70 million if you, if you continue on that, on, you know, on that project. Is that the, is, and that's cycling and pedestrian. Can you just tell me, is that the, is that the funding f that was identified in the transportation master plan? Is that part of the 70 million? Through you, Mr. Chair. Um, 70 million was for the cycling, but we also had 40 million for structures, for cycling and pedestrian structures. And that's mm -hmm. what this number is that you're okay. seeing. So this is part of the 40 million. So the 70 million is part of your, the, in the um, SI. Uh, so there's absolutely nothing in this, but that 70 million that was in the transportation master plan that was identified to be spent over the next 30 years, that number is nowhere in this document? Uh, as uh, the city treasurer mentioned, it would be in your SI um, uh, bucket, which you will see later in the year. So the SI bucket is what, 32 million total? It's, it's 32 million this year and 20 million each year after for the term of this council. So how much would have to be spent every year to get 70 million over 15 years? What, what would that require? Sorry, I'm asking you because I can't do the math quick enough. <laughs> um, you want to spend 70 million over 15 years? I think Vivi has a number. 
in, a, in our cycling and pedestrian plan, it worked out to slightly over four million a year for cycling and uh, slightly over two million a year for um, the sidewalk program. So when we uh, have the uh, strategic initiatives in front of us um, and we want to uh, keep our commitment, which I do very much so, around pedestrian and cycling infrastructure, I'm looking at $6 million out of 32 so that I you know, I, so that I, so that I'm committed to that transportation master plan. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So I see that, you know, again, I see that as going up against the climate change mass, you know, the climate change plan and a lot of other very important and necessary initiatives that we have in this city. Um, and uh, I, so I'm disappointed that, you know, we're, we're, we're throwing it all into one bucket, shaking it up, and we're doing that. After the after we've agreed on on the budget, so I just want to put it out there. I I, I do believe that we need to take um, uh, uh, we need to be we need to think about how we how we uh, fund um, the things that as a council we have uh, we have committed to. So. I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, we'll have that discussion through strategic initiatives in the next budget. One other quick question I have is um, on page 79, I guess this is more for, for Kevin, and it's, I'm, I'm not questioning it, I just, I just wonder why uh, the uh, renewal of city assets here, why this isn't funded by parking revenue. Um, I thought that it would have been. Do you see what I'm looking at? The uh, parking equipment and facilities rehabilitation. Uh, perhaps I can answer that. It says tax supported dedicated. It, the dedicated reserve is the parking reserve. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, um, and next is uh, Councillor Fleury, followed by Councillor Chernyshenko. Is there anybody else that wishes to be added to the list? Councillor Rouge, Councillor Cotter. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. A uh, couple of questions. Uh, I, I first off would start by saying that I, I agree with you that we need to do something about the um, the snow removal uh, and that reserve uh, element of it. But just to start off, start us off. Um, I, I wonder, Kevin, if you um, how often your different zones of the city do a review of where we need to. We know that our big cost in in the winter maintenance is snow removal. And we've been going uh, and exchanging emails in the past on locations where we currently remove snow, where I, I personally think we should not. So I've expressed that, where I think there's a no sidewalk, a boulevard, we should just plow to the edge of the curb, and everything else should be casted up. Is, is there an opportunity for cost savings in that snow removal portion of the budget? Uh, if we do, a, are, are we doing a review? That's, I guess, where I'm trying to get at. Uh, through the chair, that will be part of the review this summer, but uh, just to be clear, we, our removals are actually driven by our maintenance quality standards, so it talks about travel width of street, etc. And in some cases, you will see an, a street that you think is removed, but actually it is casted. So if there's no sidewalk, we de most definitely cast it over to the whatever's on the other side of the road. That might be what uh, some some of your staff are telling you, but I can give you roads where that's not the case. I mean, St. Patrick, um, north side between uh, between Vanier Parkway and King Edward, where there's no residential, we're doing it. And to be honest, it looks awful too because we're removing snow where there's nothing. It's an, a boulevard. So I, I'll leave it with you. I don't want to go in, in depth. We'll take it offline, but. To me, there's a, a deeper, a deeper review that that's needed there. Uh, on page 19 and on page 37. So one is the fleet cost. We're growing it by three million, and the other one's the fleet maintenance. We're growing, uh, we're growing it by four million. Uh, and I know the explanation speaks of some of the winter, um, the, the winter-related costs. I, I wonder uh, if you could maybe express. Uh, the logic with regards to how, when do we decide to purchase an equipment, when do we decide to, to, uh, to rent an equipment, and 
w that is that growth based on uh, based on our current city growth, or is it just uh, a full fleet uh, fleet renewal uh, strategy? Uh, part of it's renewal, but um, for the new fleet uh, capital that's in the budget, um, that is tied to operating. So if there, as you know, there's uh, no FTS in the budget this year, so we won't be purchasing that capital fleet if there's no operating uh, budgets that could be tied to the fleet. In some circumstances, uh, fleet may not require an operator if it's a trailer or something like that, and operating dollars can be uh, can be found elsewhere to keep uh, keep that piece of equipment running. So um, there may be purchases there, but for the rest of it, if there's no FTEs or operating dollars, then we won't be purchasing it. Okay, and, and on that front, uh, I know that Zambonis would be part of that fleet. We often get questions from Arena users uh, regarding uh, us trans going to f only purchase or rental of electric Zambonis or uh, where, where is that at in, in, your, in our procurement policies? Is that the case currently? Uh, we do consider uh, both lease and purchase, and generally they are, the replacements are purchased. Uh, the electric Zambonis, I think we've had some trials with them, and there are still some issues with them, so we haven't gone too far down that road. I think it's an area of improvement. When, when we see the... Uh, I, 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 I understand that the Olympic Games are, are, are well funded, but when you see that those international competitions are man mandating that Zambonis have to be electric, I think that we need to look at uh, a deeper aspect of it, especially in terms of uh, cost saving, but also health of, of the facility users. Um, Question on page uh, 74. So we talk about uh, transit corridor protection, and I wonder if the planning of that is with regards to um, to areas of growth, or if we have zones in uh, the downtown core where we are planning to uh, to spend some of that for for the for future needs. Councillor, this is. Um a program whereby we have it in case um, property comes up and there's an opportunity to acquire it for anything that's been identified in our TNP as part of the transit uh, network. Um, so uh, I think for the downtown, for the rapid transit facilities, we, we have that in hand with the Confederation line. There may be things that we may need for transit priority, so that's what this is for, and that could be in the downtown uh, some spots. Um, the, uh, on page 81, it's regarding the, um, the street lights, and uh, there's a fair budget. I understand some are just uh, regular maintenance, but I wonder with uh, what I assume to be an LED plan that's, that's going to come forward, I wonder if we're, we're, we're spending the money w having that in mind and we're not duplicating efforts on the same network. The, uh, the street lighting work will be mostly infrastructure work. Uh, whenever we're replacing a head now, we're replacing it with an LED, any new development uh, installations are LED, and we will be coming forward uh, later spring, summer with a separate report on an LED rollout for the city. Okay, and then uh, on page 126, it's the Prince of Wales uh, cycling um, proposal. As you know, uh, you know, I support my colleagues that are in that area and that want to establish that connection. I think it's an important one. But I wonder um, if we're not spending money uh, limiting ourselves in connecting properly OC Transpo and STO with this capital investment. I'd like some reassurance on that. Um, Councillor, uh, th that's correct. There's always the uh, protection for the um, interprovincial transit connection in this corridor. Um, this account was looking at something to use a, an asset that we have in the interim, perhaps putting in something relatively inexpensive and use that for a number of years before uh, interprovincial transit is introduced. And the uh, interprovincial transit actually is not within our affordable plan, so it's a number of years away post-2031. That, that's based on current provincial and federal programs, but 
if, if something would become available regarding our transit use, when, when we be, uh, you know, spending money and undercutting ourselves uh, that opportunity? Um, I guess it, uh, the value of this would be in the timing of when that comes in, and I think currently the city is um, investing in the Federation line and also Stage 2, um, Stage 2 LRT, so this would probably, if we get funding, it would have to be behind the, um, the request that we're going to be making for Stage 2 LRT. So it, uh, what we would do for this project, for using it in the interim, is looking at a solution and trying to... Um, make best use of it for as long as possible and but if uh, if we're hearing that there's going to be some funding in 10 15 years and you know it has to come into play into our design and what we do here with this account as well well I, I guess I, I'm supportive of uh, both directions but I'm I was more uh, leaning in the past where we talked about a cantilever approach where we're not removing that opportunity because once we do establish that cycling connection it's going to be a weird conversation, especially if it's in the short term, to either re-put rail or reinvest on that same corridor. So I want to, I, I, I don't, I'm not trying not, for us not to fund this from a cycling standpoint. I'm just trying to say that if we do spend the money, that we're not hurting our chances of resolving uh, the STO buses coming through our downtown. We would not be. <coughs> Excuse me. No, I don't think uh, what we're proposing here would um, uh, put us in a bad position to um, to use this corridor for uh, public transit in the future. And yes, in the future uh, we would have both facilities and the um, uh, the sidewalk and the um, cycling facility would be cantilevered. So this, for a fairly relatively cheap amount, we could get. Um, we would be putting it on the deck if we're not using the corridor for rail transit. Okay. Um, my final one is, uh, so if you combine page 104, uh, the sidewalk and curb rehab, page 112, the missing link study, and page 113, development sidewalks, they're all very close in, in kind of the goal. And I find that it, it's helpful for zones that you don't have roads or where you have uh, development at the time the development application comes in. But we struggle in the core uh, with missing links. And uh, I remember the pedestrian plan coming in and, and highlighting key areas in the Vanier Parkway, on Landry, on Brandt, where we have there's small missing links, often 30 to 40 meters. And we can never find money to get those missing links corrected. So I, I wonder if you can uh, guide me to where those types of missing links, I think it helps other colleagues as well, can be uh, resolved because we have existing residents, existing bus service, existing snow removal in those zones, and our residents feel that there, there, there's a missing link, so there's a safety issue and we're not funding it pro appropriately. So I'm wondering if I'm not, see not u utilizing those, uh, those allocations appropriately. With our pedestrian plan, um, those were standalone projects where we couldn't connect them to a, uh, a road project or a development um, application. Uh, so those are standalone. And then with, with this account for the missing link study, this is where we root it further to see where, um, where things have fallen through. Uh, that development is over here, and our other standalone project is there with a short section that's missing. Actually, in that case, we would probably include it in that uh, standalone project. But where there is no road work and um, there's no other activity or another project to piggyback on, this is what the uh, missing link study account is about, to identify those and seek funding for them. Okay. Well, I'd like, I'd like for us to review that because it is a concern of, of residents in our area. So finally, just maybe on, on a comment on this, uh, I, I'm... Uh, I support what my colleagues were saying regarding um, having uh, cycling and pedestrian uh, infrastructure and, and projects in the base budget. I, I think that it's weird to have it in SI because first off it limits what council can do in with SIs and then it puts us in not a long-term discussion 
with uh, with our with groups in the community and our neighborhoods. So uh, I wonder, Ms. Simulek, if what would be the strategy to bring it to a more more certain long-term future for those types of uh, funding? So the comment that it reduces what you can do with SI, it would have reduced it either way because I would have reduced the size of the envelope because that's where it was funded from. There was no other source of funding for those projects. So one way or the other, you would have, you're either going to approve it through SIs with a larger envelope or you're going to take it out of the SIs and you're going to have a smaller envelope for SIs. So I, this concern that you're uh, basically don't have enough uh, that it's reducing your capacity, I, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I don't see what the, what the concern is. Well, but, you know, the concern for my fund is that we engage with residents, we take a lot of staff time for our transportation master plan and our cycling plan and our pedestrian plan, and that then we come to a given budget and we rehash every discussion once again with no strategy around Okay, in 2015 we're funding this, in 2016 we're funding this. And it's hard for us uh, to, because we're, we, want, we have our local priorities and we can't buy into the broader picture because we're stuck in this SI world where it's easy to not invent but create pilot projects in the neighborhoods that might be of higher importance on a strategic standpoint but not, a co not fit into the cohesive plan. So I would much rather if it was a smaller SI pot but we had certainty longer term on the cycling and pedestrian standpoint. In retrospect, what we should have done when we filed the transportation master plan is we should have had a recommendation in there to direct that that funding become permanent, that it no longer be considered an SI, but we didn't do that. And we didn't realize it would cause such angst with you today. So uh, what I would suggest is when you go through your SI um, exercise, your term of council priorities, that that be the direction that's given. So that in 2019, we don't have this discussion again. It becomes that that's the permanent source of funding and the envelope is reduced from the start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. I'm just going to jump here quick just so I, I understand what you just said to us. So that direction would have to come during the SI discussion in May or June. It wouldn't come at Council when we're discussing budget. Just, just so we know where we should be doing it if we want to, in fact, do it. You always have the option if you want to, because you know those are in the SI budget you, you, or envelope. You could ha put forward a motion that says you're going to pre-approve those right now and not wait for that exercise, and you're going to make that a permanent source of funding. So we would start the exercise with the, I think, $6 million out of there to begin with, and you'd start with a smaller envelope uh, and to deal with for your term of council priorities. So I would not, and unless you're going to bring a motion to do that, I would then wait until your SI discussion, and at which time you then say, that becomes the permanent source of funding from this time forward, and the SI bucket, bucket is reduced uh, forever. Yeah, no, and that, that's a good answer. My concern was that if we didn't raise it at the budget meeting, that we'd have to net, wait till the next budget cycle to give that direction, because we would have been finished with the budget, and we would, in fact, be saying to you, we want to make this part of the base budget. You can do it at the SI okay, discussion as well. Fair enough. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Councillor Chernyshenko. Thank you. I've got a few uh, specific questions and then a general comment. Um, the school guard, uh, crossing guard program, um, angst was just uh, raised as a word. There was considerable angst uh, in a couple of years ago uh, over the fact that there was uh, no money available to add additional uh, school crossing guards. What, what is our capacity now to, to add uh, that, that may be in there? And my apologies if I didn't read that item carefully. Um, and is there a capacity when I'm thinking now of the Main Street reconstruction and community angst, I promise that's the last time I'll use the word, um, uh, as we have a big reconstruction project, particularly around schools, um, that there be available uh, crossing guards at targeted places we did do that with the bank reconstruction around schools. Now people are really hoping it'll be there. Is there capacity in there? Can I be saying to my community, there's a fund I can dip into? Of course, we'll have to look at other needs as well, but there is some capacity there now. 
Okay, through the chair, uh, first of all, we're funding 22 additional guards in this budget. Uh, 12 were from last year, and that's the annualization cost from last year. 10 additional new ones that we'll be looking at warranting through the spring, and then they'll be put in place in September. But to your point, uh, and we have done this in the past, as you pointed out, through the capital funding, we'll be able to add a crossing guard if required in a construction uh, zone. Okay, so that would have to come out of the budgeted amount for that reconstruction project as, appo as opposed to out of this program? That is correct. Okay. okay. Um, I think it is something we, if, if we aren't doing it already, perhaps I should ask that as a question. Are we doing that already as a matter of course, or is it really only in a response to a council or a community saying, hey, we've got some particular issues at certain intersections near schools, uh, et cetera? As part of the uh, construction uh, planning, the traffic safety people do look at things like detours, et cetera, and that would be brought up at that point. So if it's something that uh, is identified at that point, we would pursue a tra uh, crossing guard. Mm. So I, I, I will use this opportunity to give a heads up then. It is certainly a concern um, for the Main Street project, and so far the response I have had is, well, there isn't a you know, budget for uh, crossing guards. Maybe that's been built into the uh, additional money here, but uh, I, I like to flag that that's going to be coming. Um, maintenance of roadside planters and weeding. Um, that is something that um, is not well funded. I don't see a budget uh, item in uh, in this uh, in this budget. Uh, what is the city's approach to that? Uh, through the chair, that is something that would be looked at at the SI stage. Okay. I would like to especially flag that with, uh, uh, with 2017 coming, um, key um, boulevards. Uh, uh, of course, we can make good use of uh, volunteer labor for a number of things. I'm sort of reinvigorating that around Bank Street in, in Old Ottawa South now, but I don't believe the city should be expecting um, its planters and its um, beautification of its sidewalks to be volunteer-based. Um, um, street lighting replacements uh, is here in transportation. It comes up under environment as a air quality climate change master plan, one of the identified items. Um, where is the city then with um, moving towards LED and if we got a really good fix on the kind of cost savings that we're getting for that investment. Do we, my understanding is we're, we're quite certain there's a, a positive, demonstrable, and quite rapid return on, on that investment. Uh, is this now the new direction the city's going in? And through the chair, um, we did, as you're aware, ran some pilot projects, and that uh, did bring uh, the findings were that there is considerable savings. Uh, and as I stated, we'll be bringing a report forward uh, spring summer. Um, and it will be funded outside the budget envelope. Okay, thank you. Um, a bit of a comment with the question at the end here. Um, uh, I'd like to praise the direction the city's been going in towards uh, its transit focus, towards the modal shift. It's happening. We can all critique that it could be happening faster, but it's happening. Um, the um, focus on intensification is starting to see positive results, which should bring, um, you know, quality of life benefits, cost savings through um, people, the, the density, the benefits uh, of density. Um, but what I'm going to say now, I need to preface, um, this is not about urban, suburban, rural. The simple fact is that it was put, just put to us now in some very graphic terms, the monster that needs to keep being fed um, in less graphic terms, each new kilometer, each new road shoulder, each new road, wherever it is in the city, generates generate decades, perhaps forever, in terms of maintenance and operational costs. Uh, and it's something I'm, I'm not sure many politicians take into account as they make decisions to build a new road, to widen a road, just what that is implying in terms of costs uh, into the future. Do we have a financial forecasting model that would allow us, when we're looking at, you know, an infrastructure change in my ward or a new road being built out to somewhere that doesn't have one now, a model that also includes annual road repair, annual snow clearing, so that we all have a full understanding of you decide to build this, 
it's going to come with this price tag into the future. Otherwise, we find ourselves with this budget pressure that Mr. Harley pointed out. Uh, so many gentlemen, other gentlemen, I've forgotten his name, Holmes, I believe it was, uh, pointed it out. You know, we have deteriorating roads, uh, and it's going to be a constant pressure that we, we can't get away from. Um, do, have we looked at a forecasting model like that? Do they exist? The uh, Transportation Master Plan actually did include uh, the costs, the increased operating costs as a result of the expanding road network, and it also included uh, an estimate of how much you would have to increase your contribution to capital by every year for the growth element of the asset base, not just the inflation on it, or which we're doing now, and then the catch-up piece, which we're doing, but there's a growth component every year. You should be increasing the contribution for that so that you have the money available. And there was a discussion on that in the transportation master plan. Um, are you living up to that and, and actually making that contribution? No, you're not. Okay. And so that's a discussion, again, that uh, Council needs to have when we come back with the Comprehensive Asset Manager Plan as to how much you should be putting aside every year or adding to your reserves to deal with the growth in the asset base. My time is up. It's a very for short question, if you will. So that information is already available to us. Um, and was as part of Transportation Master Plan, it's up to us to bite the bullet uh, and, uh, and ensure we're adequately funding it or else we're going to see a steady deterioration of, of our assets. Yes, and we'll remind you of that on a regular budget basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Drews. Thank you, Chair. A uh, question probably to Wayne. Uh, are these projects that we are below the line, like the road surfacing, uh, are the work and the design has been done and the core samples been already taken or we really have to wait another year for that process just for an information? Uh. Mr. Chair, no, we're in a position that if, uh, if the, we have favorable funding with the projects above the line that we could, we could advance the works this year is the intent. It also depends on, on our analysis of the funding analysis. If it's in the 11th hour and it wouldn't be prudent to move forward paving the road in November, we would secure those funds remain those funds and move forward in the spring following. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kadri. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Just a couple of questions. First of all, going back onto the budget on page 73, this is about the Western Transit Bayshore to Moody uh, Station. Uh, in terms of uh, the money that's asked for on this budget in 2015, is that the total number of dollars required for that uh, project? Or in 2016-17, there's other dollars yet to be asked for? Mr. Chair, this is the, uh, in working with Planning Growth Manager, this is a final ask for us to deliver that project um, from Bayshore to Moody. Uh, with the intent of uh, starting construction later this year, subject to NCC approvals and what have you, but the intent today is to move forward with that project later this year, and that funding is sufficient. And that's to completion of uh, 2018 for the project? The completion date uh, we are looking at, I believe the completion date is at the end of 17 of that And of I'm that just project. looking at the document, it says 18 on there, so... Okay, I, I, could, uh, I could refresh you on that, but uh, it's worth targeting, yeah. I think that, that is on the safe side, but we are try targeting to advance the work, so we try to have it operational by N17. But I can confirm that with you offline. Okay. Any contingency built into this project? So if we do run co or run over a cost, that would be looked after within the Sun Willow? Mr. Chair, the, 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 since uh, June of 2013, when Councillor approved our overall cost estimating uh, classification approach, uh, there are contingencies carried on projects. It depends on where you are. Earlier on, if it's very conceptual, you would have a higher level con uh, contingency with, for the unforeseen. As you move towards the tender and you're finalizing the design, so you can move to tender, we carry typically in the range of 10% uh, to, to, to be able to address those unforeseen, which, which typically do become uh, seen through the course of construction. Thank you for that, Mr. Neal. On page uh, 74, it's uh, under call center nine, uh, what is it, uh, 907839 on 2015 park and ride facilities. 
And again, there's dollars that are mentioned here um, in terms of this is an annual program to increase the capacity of existing park and rides. And existing park and rides, uh, do we know the scope of those park and rides as to is any of them in the West End like Eagleson Park and Ride or Terry Fox? Or are they just all citywide park and rides existing? Um. I don't have the specifics as to which park and ride. I don't think it's an expansion of the Eagleson. And it's, um, this is the program, although it's uh, in past funding, we had it for innovation uh, park and ride lot. Um, so the request for uh, 2015 is looking at property purchases for future lots that uh, may be outside of the green belt. So it would be, we would look at uh, places in Canada um, and uh, if there's anything needed in Barhaven, out in Orleans as well. So this is not, and none of this money is for the existing work on existing parks, park and rides? Uh, not the funding in 2015. So 2015 is all for new projects in the areas beyond the green belt? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, question also on page 49 under transit services total under the account 905926. And I think uh, one of my colleagues was asking questions on this missing link sidewalks. What I'm interested in is to find out how is that money put into that envelope of missing link sidewalks, the 230. Is, that, is there a formula for that? Uh, do we know all the projects that are in the city that are, are classified under that uh, in terms of missing links? And if so, is that how the money is calculated on this, uh, in this envelope? Councillor, the details of that is on page 112 with the, um, the narratives. So this is uh, just the study. Uh, it's, requ it's required. The funding will, will uh, the study will be to clarify the type of facility, route options, constraints, and confirm feasibility, and undertake some um, design, preliminary design as well, and, and, and costing of projects. No, I saw the narrative, but my concern is, are we putting enough money into this uh, budget or into this envelope of uh, projects? to satisfy completion of the projects that are missing in the city. I mean, the, as uh, Councilor Fleury mentioned earlier, there's all kinds of missing link sidewalk pieces, and not only in the uh, you know, existing areas in the core, but also in the growth areas. And if we don't look at those growth areas, they're just going to continue to multiply. So my concern is, are we dedicating enough money annually in this uh, envelope to look after some of those projects? Uh, Councillor, I believe that we are. I'm just looking at past years and how we had spent them. We've, we have spent the money. It's not uh, that we leave money behind or we're in need of additional funding, but this is a, a, a good amount for this program, and, and it's an ongoing thing, so we will continue to work at those uh, missing links. Yet we don't seem to be able to get ahead of those missing link sidewalk projects every year. I mean, like I said a few seconds ago about growing areas, We've got missing link sidewalks in those areas uh, where we're building brand new communities, yet we're not being able to finish the requirement for existing communities in those growing areas in the city. So my concern still is that are we putting enough money in? I mean, we can pick six projects out of a city and say, okay, that's all we're going to do this year. But while you're putting, completing six projects, you're falling behind on two others in, in the growth areas, for example. Mr. Chair, all I would add is that this number, of, if I'm recalling right, is a number we've had consistently over the last number of years. Could we use more money? Yes, we could in terms of being able to, to catch up. I think the, uh, the, the review that uh, Ms. Chi referred to that we're going to be doing on this, I think I would see us having a, a larger ask in subsequent budgets, but uh, you know, we, it, this allows us to do what we've identified as, as projects. And the only thing is, this isn't this is tax support. There's no development charges involved, so you know we have to take it out of the tax base. And as I say, we've been pretty consistent in the level that we spent this for, you know, the last number of years. So, Mr. Moser, on to that comment about uh, the formula 
uh, in terms of development charges versus tax supported. Because in some new communities those sidewalks are not being able to complete, do we need to revisit that formula and see if we can apply some of that DC money in those newer areas where the sidewalks are missing right from day one? Certainly in terms of using development charges for you know, any existing development, no, we can, we, we couldn't use that. In terms of areas that are, you know, going over time, being able to be developed by, uh, you know, the developers doing all of those service services, we, you know, tend to, if there's a critical missing link, link we try to use persuasion to have the, you know, the developer as they're, they're doing it to, to fill that gap, but I do not think there's any ability to use development charges for filling in these gaps in existing existing or planned development. And again, I don't mean to harp on this issue, but uh, you know, where there's an arterial, arterial or a collector road, which uh, in, the, in the city plan says that it must have sidewalks on both sides of the street, yet, you know, I can give you a couple examples in my community where the sidewalks are not there on both sides of the street. So, uh, you know, are we falling, you know, behind further by not completing those projects and continuing to make projects like that go forward. Mr. Chair, I guess depending on the, the age of these, these roads, I mean, we certainly look to when we're doing the you know, renewal of the roads, we'd look to do that in terms of, you know, that when, you know, when Mr. Newell does the, the program of your reconstruction, we sort of look at, at all the, the modes of, of travel, but in terms of those that, you know, have that criteria but are built for some time, it's, you know, it tends to be done when we do, when we reconstruct the roads as of going in there now and finish. So in other words, a road that may be built, uh, let's say, five years ago or ten years ago, and that road's not going to be up for renewal for 20 or 25 years in the city plan, that means that sidewalk will remain missing till that 20, 25 years, or unless we can put a little bit more money into the missing link sidewalk program. Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, but a question still remains. How do staff identify those missing links? How do they take priority one over another? I mean, in Councillor Fleury's word, if there's a sidewalk and he's got traffic on King Edward, and I'm just using King Edward as an example, versus a sidewalk in a growth area that may not be as important as King Edward, how is those projects identified to say, okay, this one takes priority over the next one? Uh, Councillor, um, we identified the how to prioritize projects in our pedestrian plan. So if it's uh, a link that's needed to uh, connect a school uh, or to connect to a major uh, recreational facility, uh, to transit, um, to uh, shopping complexes, th that's what we look at in terms of prioritizing them. So what about collector roads and arterial roads? On Are arterial they not com considered part of a complete street and wouldn't sidewalk be a out of that when, equation? Yes, I mean, um, when again, when roads are um, reconstructed, all those elements are expected to be included in that renewal project. Uh, when we're widening roads, those are expected to be included as well. So we're talking about existing um, sections that uh, don't have any other work happening to them, um, and then we have to look at that, how are they prioritized, and they end up, the ones are, um, are quite needed because of those um, factors I just mentioned, they end up being on the list of standalone projects, and they're funded through the uh, pedestrian program. Just a question to maybe Mr. Wiley, and maybe it's his department, and maybe some of you other uh, ladies and gentlemen may have an input into it. The Ottawa Student Transit Authority just did their review for the busing. What I'd like to know is how much uh, pressure has that put on the city from different perspectives, i.e. new crossing guards required, or completion of sidewalks is required, or also on the operation side where a sidewalk that wasn't being plowed, let's say, till 9 o'clock in the morning, now it has to be plowed by 7 o'clock because the distance for walking for those students have increased because of this OSTA review. Uh, through the chair, when us was doing their review, uh, they we made it clear that we wouldn't be adding our maintenance, any maintenance of non-maintenance facilities. Um, now, having said that, there's still we still don't have a clear view of what the impact's going to be. The numbers have shrunk down to I think last uh, we heard was about 1,500 students may be affected. Um, we're still waiting to see where those those students where those areas will be. Um, 
I expect, though, we will probably get pressure when the changes get made this September. That's when parents will start calling and asking about crossing guards and potentially winter maintaining facilities. Thank you for that, Mr. Riley, and that's exactly the reason why I'm asking, because in, in my area... Yeah, Councillor Codry, you're, you're over your time, so I'll let you wrap up, but you're going to have to go back on the list if you have other questions. All right, I'll come back on the list, Mr. Chair. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, Councillor Cockish. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I think my colleagues touched on most of the, um, the points uh, that I wanted to... Uh, Raised, but I had a quick question just in terms of understanding the budgetary uh, process on uh, the implications as a result of the um, affordability framework that we've adopted as well as uh, the last round of TMPs. And is it fair to say that as a result of the money that's going towards light rail, a lot of the uh, road infrastructure projects have been uh, pushed back uh, during those deliberations? Um, Councillor, I don't think the roads were pushed off. There's a, the transit um, budget of which um, for, for major transit facilities uh, it had, was one-third city and expected we were expecting two-thirds funding from senior levels of government. So we looked at transit separate um, uh, and then looking at the demand on, on transit. Well, overall we have the demand for travel and uh, we set our policy and our targets for those that would be on transit and then we provide that and the rest um, would be on roads or the active transportation. So uh, our target was, uh, I think, uh, it was 50% um, in, in transit and active modes and 50% in, in cars. So I would not say that the uh, funding for um, the light rail program uh, pushed roads off. It's okay. just... So why, can you clarify why then a lot of um, road projects, you know, across the city got pushed back? in the last deliberations of the TMP if it wasn't for the uh, it, light rail costs? It's the overall um, uh, city's affordability with one third was uh, towards the, um, the uh, transit projects and, and that was not, it was not 100% city dollars, it was just one third of the city's share towards transit. So transit needs to be funded. Um, so they, they were done independently. Um, overall for the whole network, but I, mm -hmm. it was not um, a deliberate um, decision that, uh, that roads would be pushed off in order to fund uh, light rail first, although that is uh, your, your, uh, your um, approved TMP speaks to 50% transit and active modes and 50% cars. Mm -hmm. No, and I appreciate that there's federal and provincial funding there, and I understand that, but I just want to clarify that um, the reason for, you know, roads like Prince of Wales, roads like Bank Street uh, getting pushed off was not uh, because of that, because that was my understanding is that a lot of uh, the money that may have been going towards those projects got pushed back for that reason, but you're saying it's not the case. It was not because of transit. What we, we know that we have more needs than we can um, afford to pay. So it, through the TMP where we prioritize projects, we looked at um, does the community need improved access within the community. So we looked at that first. Are there um, um, advantages for one project? If you do that one, you get so much more benefit mm -hmm. all around. So that's we went through that exercise. And then for those that are commuting between communities, we would hope that they would be on transit instead. Mm -hmm. So um, I could uh, sit uh, with you afterwards to talk about the uh, the criteria that we use to prioritize projects, mm -hmm. and but the the key one is about um, circulation within the community itself and and sort of connectivity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's one of my main concerns is that a lot of, uh, you know, in the growth areas like in, in Gloucester, South Nepean, in my riding, whether it's Finley Creek or, or Barhaven, we're seeing a lot of the intersections um, at capacity and they're failing and we're having to uh, make various adjustments like putting a, a left turn arrow in some areas like uh, Leitrim and Albion as an example. And I'm wondering, because of that affordability framework, if there's an opportunity um, to... Um, work on these projects, for example, like Bank Street or Prince of Wales, which we are doing with Prince of Wales, doing those modifications um, at the intersections, at the key intersections where uh, there are some issues. If we can look at other uh, road projects that have been pushed back in the transportation master plan and 
maybe dealing with specific parts of them. So, for example, with Bank Street, if we deal with a specific um, intersection like uh, like Leitrim and Bank and, and look at those uh, projects instead of committing to the many millions that may be needed to widen various phases of it, we look at the uh, key phases because of the affordability uh, framework that we've adopted. And is that something that, uh, that can be done? Councillor, you're speaking about how to um, get the low-hanging fruits if possible, mm -hmm. and if we can uh, do quick, easy implementation rather than the larger project. Yes, we can have a look at that. Uh, we do have the intersection modifications program, but there's also a very heavy uh, demand on that program as well. So uh, we, we can take this back and uh, review it. The TMP itself is also a, a living document. Um, although we've set out the the phases for the projects up to 2031, um, we will be up for another update in um, starting in. 2017 for 2018, so we will review that again. Mm -hmm. And we take these uh, things into account as well, even um, when we do the annual budget. We try to stay uh, within the projects identified here, but if we can find um, uh, inexpensive, quick win solutions, we're, we're always looking mm -hmm. for those as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll yeah. talk okay. to staff and my colleagues in other, uh, other branches to okay. work on that. Thank you, Ms. Chief, because I think that is important given the circumstances mm -hmm. we're in, is that we have some flexibility with how we uh, procure some of these projects are looking at instead of doing you know the few kilometers that we need doing the intersections or the key pockets that are causing the uh, the um, the traffic jams in, in some of these uh, areas we will try okay thank you uh, thank you councillor um, I'm going to suggest we have we have two speakers left um, and then the vote and then we have a uh, motion um, that Councillor Chernoshenko is going to bring without notice, but it, I think it's largely uncontentious. So I'm going to suggest that we carry on rather than taking a lunch break. If everybody's okay with that, just push through. Okay. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Councillor Manette, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. What percentage of the road infrastructure investments is being done towards Maine, Ontario and collector roads at this time? And if you don't have it today, that's fine. If you just send me the information. Jerry, yes, I will get you the more uh, detailed information, but when, when you are working in an environment with limited funds, your, your dollars would be targeted from a risk-based perspective more towards the arterials, collectors versus the locals, but we can certainly follow up with you with uh, more specific details. Thank you. Because I might have a follow-up offline once I get the information. Thank you. And the other question is on snow removal. I noticed that the East End Councillors Using the growth in the East End and uh, keeping up with the existing growth, we had asked for an extra uh, truck and an extra driver uh, in the budget. It was not in this year's budget. I respect that because uh, you can always get what you ask for, obviously. Uh, but uh, could we be assured that it will be considered uh, in the next year's budget? Through the chair, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, back to Councillor Cotry. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And just coming back to that point uh, that we were talking about, Mr. Wiley, about the OSTA, is there any way for us as a city going forward to uh, sort of monitor those costs, additional costs to the city that we had not planned on? Uh, in terms of uh, like the new crossing guards. Now, some of those crossing guards sections were identified previous years to be imp implemented, but there are new requests coming in already from school uh, schools themselves to say we need new crossing guards. Now, there's a cost to that, so I'm wondering if we can, you know, monitor that cost going forward. Through the chair, what I would uh, suggest is um, they would be part of our regular warrant system, and, and you're right, you're quite correct. Some of those locations, because there's additional pupils walking, uh, may make, the, make it suddenly a warranted location. But we can certainly identify those as we go forward with our next list of uh, crossing guards. And that would also apply for additional capital work in terms of uh, sidewalk maintenance, uh, operation for sidewalk maintenance, and capital works in terms of addition of new sidewalks. Uh, through the chair, certainly for the maintenance side, I'll have to defer to uh, to Mr. Newell about the capital side. Mr. Newell, uh, 
just to repeat the question for you, in terms of the additional sidewalk requirements because of the OSTA review, will we be keeping track of that in terms of cost added to the city uh, financing or budget? In so the future, I'm talking about like next year, 2018, in those years. Um, sorry, I'm not familiar with the OSTA review. I apologize on, on the acronym. Okay. OSTA is the Ottawa Students Transportation uh, Administration, I guess, okay. or authority that uh, carries uh, school kids back and forth in the yellow buses. Okay. So would we take, just to clarify your question, would we take that into account when you look at the sidewalk needs for new missing links? Is it, was that the question? Or? Our requests coming from different areas in the city by the schools to add new sidewalks to areas where the kids are now walking a longer distance than they were previously. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, yeah, just to clarify, so the programs that fall under my, my department would be the renewal programs of existing sidewalks, so maybe I'll defer to, to John or Vivi to talk about the new ones. We, we end up being the builders of those new sidewalks, but as far as the analysis of their needs and warrants, I would defer to, uh, to Vivi or, or John on that. Okay, Ms. Vivi Chi, next time, you know, you can take it offline and discuss with the, within the department and come back to us with an answer if that's possible. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Are there any other questions, concerns, comments around this particular budget? Okay, so um, then we're going to go through the roadmap uh, motion, which is uh, comprised of two pieces, and um, so uh, and we'll we'll vote on one each. So uh, number one is the transportation committee operating budget page five as follows, and if you could vote on each segment as we go through it, and then we'll vote on it as a whole. As a whole. So 1A, General Manager's Office, Operating Resource Requirements, page 7. Carried? Carried. B, Business Services, Operating Resource Requirement, page 10. Carried? Carried. Uh, C, Traffic Services, as follows, 1, User Fees, page 17, and Operating Resource Requirement, page 13. Carried? D, Road Services, as follows, 1, User Fees, page 21, 2, Operating Resource Requirements, page 18. Carried? E, parking services as follows, one user fees pages 25 through 36, two parking operations, operating resource requirements page 22. Carried? F, fleet services as follows, one user fees page 41, and two operating resource, ma uh, resource requirement page 37. Carried? G, transportation planning operating resource requirement page 44. Carried? All right, so we carry the operating budget. Uh, two, uh, the Transportation uh, Committee Capital Programs, pages 48 to 51, uh, as follows. 2A, Fleet Services, page 52, individual projects listed, pages 53 uh, through 55. Carried? B, Integrated Roads, Waste and Wastewater Capital Program, page 56, individual projects listed, page 57 through 71, tax supported funding. Carried? 2C, traffic serv transit services rather, page 72, individual projects listed pages 73 through 75, carried. 2D, transportation services page 76, individual projects listed pages 77 uh, through 127, carried. So we carry the uh, capital uh, program budget as well, thank you for that. Uh, there are no in-camera items. Are there any notice of motion for consideration at subsequent meetings? All right. Any inquiries? Councilor Fleury. Sorry, Mr. Chair. I'm just opening it here. Was distracted by uh, their budget talk. Okay. So reads as follows. Um, what is the city's policy for storm removal in school drop-off zones and residential areas? How quickly after a storm can parents, teachers expect a school drop-off to be cleared of snow? And are these areas seen as high priorities to ensure safe and unimpeded access uh, to our schools? Thank you. Any other inquiries? Um, <clears throat> so, Councilor Chernyshenko has a motion to bring forward, which is time sensitive uh, because of a uh, 
a funding program which the city wishes to apply for, um, but we'll miss it if we don't pass it here and then and turn it over to council before the end of this month. So um, first uh, we need a motion. Uh, we have a motion for waiver of the rules of procedure to allow the motion to be dealt with today without prior notice. Carried. I'll ask uh, Councillor Chernyshenko to introduce his motion. I couldn't imagine in a morning where we've been debating budget that the opportunity to receive $20,000 in funding from another source would be turned down. Um, so the main motion, uh, whereas the Brookfield multi-use pathway uh, crossed the O-Train Trillium line at grade near the intersection of Brookfield Road and Junction Avenue. Um, I'll skip some of the very precise uh, location for you. And whereas starting March 2nd, though I need to amend that to March 4th, and I gather the O-Train is now back up and running as of a few minutes ago. So whereas starting March 4th, 2015, the Trillium line service has been expanded from two to four trains, resulting in a shorter head way between vehicles, and whereas the city is planning to remove the at-grade crossing to improve safety for residents using the pathway and is currently in the process of rerouting the pathway underneath the nearby Trillium Line Bridge over Sawmill Creek to maintain access for the community, and whereas Transport Canada has indicated it is prepared to provide $20,000 to the city for this project from a program that provides monetary grants to encourage the closure of at-grade crossings, noting that this funding opportunity ends on March 31, 2015. Therefore, be it resolved, the Transportation Committee recommends that Council approve and delegate the authority to the General Manager of Planning and Growth Management with the concurrence of the City Clerk and Solicitor to negotiate and enter into an agreement with Transport Canada to close the Brookfield multi-use pathway crossing and approve the receipt of grant monies from Transport Canada and be it further resolved the Transportation Committee recommends Council, Council authorize the General Manager of Planning and Growth Management to sign the required declaration relinquishing the right to the crossing and to sign the grant agreement and you have a sample attached of, uh, of a letter that would be relinquishing the right to the crossing. Thank you, Councillor Chernyshenko. Any questions, concerns? Carried. Thank you. Um, and we'll need a motion for adjournment. Vice Chairman Kenny. Just say adjourned. Yes. Okay. Carried. Okay. Our next meeting is Monday, April the 20th. Thank you, Chair.
Testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two.